Bonjour à tous, soyez les bienvenus à cette 21e rencontre d'enseignants de langue organisée par le Master en langue de l'Université pédagogique et technologique de Colombie, où l'on aura le plaisir de partager des différentes expériences en recherche des enseignants de langue. Cette année, notre sujet central se portera sur l'importance de léguer du pouvoir aux nouvelles générations et pratiques par les biais de la recherche et de l'éducation. On tient à vous remercier pour votre assistance et on espère que les discussions et sujets y traités enrichisseront et contribueront énormément au processus d'enseignement-apprentissage de la recherche dans le domaine de la pédagogie et de la didactique des langues. Merci et profitons donc de cet excellent événement. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for your very kind words, Professor Vitalia Pachon. And welcome to our 21st Teachers Move and 12th MA in Language Teaching Graduates Reunion. We hope you can share and learn from different pedagogical and research experiences in the field of languages. Before starting and on behalf of the Curricular Committee at the Master's Program in Language Teaching, I would like to thank Ana Carolina Peñalosa Rayon for her invaluable work. Also, thank you very much to Professors Yorani Romero, Sonia Rojas, and Ilva Janet Rodriguez. Thanks again to Jonathan, Annie, Daniela, Johan, Andrea, Juliet, Jimena, Paula, Alexa, Milena, and Sonita. Thanks to our MA students, graduates, and of course, the professors and under undergraduate students in the School of Languages at the Universidad Pedagógica y Tecnológica de Colombia, who have always helped us to make this event possible. For this version of the event, we have the pleasure to have experts in the field of ELT research. Dr. Dario Luis Vanegas from the University of Strathclyde, United Kingdom, will address a very significant topic nowadays, which is diversity in ELT. Professors Carolina Huitrago from Institución Universitaria Colombo-Americana, Colombia, and Professor Marta Ramirez from Universidad de los Andes, Colombia, will be sharing their teaching perspectives on flipping content intentionally. Professor Yamit Jose Fandiño Parra from Universidad de la Salle, Colombia, will be talking about the decolonial turn is a way to resist and, and transgress coloniality in ELT. We close the morning session with Dr. Cindy Cruz from the University of Arizona, United States, who will be discussing about social justice and its connections with teaching and teachers. In the afternoon at two o'clock, we count with Dr. Astrid, Astrid Núñez Pardo and Professor Maria Fernanda Telles from Universidad Externado de Colombia. They will focus on doing research on ELT materials and what it implies to move from a superficial cultural to a critical intercultural perspective. Apart from the main plenary sessions, participants will have the opportunity to attend to the concurrent sessions that will start at 3 p.m. We are honored to count on presentations from different uh, places. Universidad Regional del Sureste de Oaxaca de Juárez, Universidad Autónoma de la Ciudad de México, Universidad Autónoma San Luis Potosí, from Mexico. Escuela Normal Superior Sor Josefa del Castillo y Guevara, Universidad Distrital Francisco José de Caldas, Universidad de La Salle, Colombia, Universidad Sur Colombiana, Universidad Pontificia Bolivariana, Colegio Juan Pablo II Sede Central, Instituto Técnico Agropecuario de Guabatá, all of them from Colombia, and of course, we have presenters from the host university, Universidad Pedagógica y Tecnológica de Colombia. We thank all of our presenters for joining us today and the audience for coming. The chat box that we have in YouTube will be available for all your comments and questions. So please feel free to leave any message. Before we start our presentation, we would like to, we would like to know where you are joining us from. So please leave us your name, the place, the place where you are joining from in our YouTube chat. Don't forget also to sign up for your certificate in the links that we will be uh, sending along 
this uh, first uh, presentation. So now let's welcome our first uh, presenter, Dr. Dario Luis Vanegas. So uh, welcome Dr. Dario Luis Vanegas from the University of Strathclyde, United Kingdom. Uh, he will be talking about Empower, Engage, Extend, Diversity in ELT. Dr. Dario Luis Vanegas is a lecturer in TESOL at the School of Education, University of Strathclyde, United Kingdom. He's an active member of professional associations in Argentina and the United Kingdom. He is also the co-editor of International Perspectives on Diversity in ELT, Paul Gray, and he is currently co-editing a volume on content language integrated learning for Radridge. His main interests are teacher education, content language integrated learning, and action research. Then, Dr. Vanegas, thank you very much for accepting this invitation again. And welcome. The floor is all yours. Thank you very much, Berta. Uh, and I would like to thank the students, the colleagues, and all those people participating in this moot today. Apologies for my um, cracky voice. I've got a horrible cold. And I am drinking something which people might think it's horrible, but it's not. It's onion tea. So it's got onion, garlic, <laughs> lemon, and um, what you call this, and honey. And it's actually tasty, so I encourage you to, to try it. But anyways, um, so again, the, the pleasure is all mine because I understand that these are the events that we need in South America, in Latin America, to disseminate our practices, to disseminate the way we produce knowledge, to disseminate what we do in the classroom and outside the classroom and in any kind of language learning environment. So I'll be talking about diversity and now I'll be sharing my screen. Uh, can you all see it? Yes, Dr. Vanegas. Excellent, thank you. So as uh, Berta said, so the topic is Empower, Engage, Extend, Diversity in ELT. So the idea is to unpack what we mean by diversity. And this is something that, to some extent, we are all aware of. But of course, it always comes to, or the challenge, you might say, is, well, how to put this into practice? Because you know, theoretically speaking, we can all talk hours on end about uh, diversity. But in other stories, when we ask ourselves, okay, this is all really nice, but now how do we do diversity in our teaching or in our learning? So uh, this is a map of what we will be looking at today. Diversity, inclusion, which are terms that we, use, that we will usually um, use sometimes uh, interchangeably. And then some ideas around empower, engage, extend. And then I will be, if you will, extending that conversation into communities of practice and your own participation, your own involvement, your own engagement um, in enacting diversity in the classroom. So, um, one thing that we need to be aware of, and this is something that we are uh, conscious of, is that when we talk about diversity, we're not talking about anything which is um, disjointed from the classroom. Because when we talk about diversity, we are talking about reality. We are talking about the inherent differences that we find in educational institutions and, of course, outside educational institutions, that is society. So we are all different, and that's a very good thing, I would say. And we have different accents, whether it is our first language, other languages that we may speak. We have 
differences in terms of age, in terms of gender, in terms of interests, in terms of um, cultural background, in terms of um, our own histories as students, teachers, and as a whole, as human beings. So we will not be talking about something that is not already present in the classroom. Maybe what we will be doing now is acknowledging those differences, acknowledging all the differences that we can find in society, and we celebrate them and we discuss them so that no differences are ignored or left behind or even in some cases like punished. So to start off with, what I would like you to do using the chat box on YouTube, could you please tell us three things about yourselves? Anything. Three things about yourself. It could be where you are currently based, how many teachers, sorry, how many years of experience you have, um, what you like, what you don't like. We will be receiving the, the, the answers in the YouTube chat. Yes, exactly. Okay, so please feel free. Could you please um, repeat again what you're asking the audience for? So I'm asking the audience to um, use the chat box on YouTube to tell us three things about themselves. So it could be anything where they are currently located, like the name of the town or city where you are, whether, for example, what your interests are, something yeah, that perhaps you don't like, um, or whether you have a family or if you've got kids or if you like traveling. Um, so it could be anything. Okay, thank you. So I've got one at least here but on this side. So someone, Carolina says, Bogota, mom, educational research. So that's brilliant. So you see we've got there and then some other people will be elsewhere. For example, someone else says, um, last semester of teaching English and Spanish at the University of Nariño. Um, so, uh, Aleida saying, well, teaching for 33 years. Santanderiana family, I love researching. Sandra says, passionate, friendly, lovely. That's beautiful. And maybe one more. Angie, Angie says, shy but passionate Colombian English teacher. William says, lab research and education. Lady Marcela says, educator, wine lover, and good friend. And last, Jimena says, uh, Visha Maria, uh, university level, teaching for more than 20 years. So you see that in just a couple of minutes, we've managed to collect so much diversity, geographical location, years of experience, degrees that you have or that you are pursuing. There is some commonality in terms of an interest in educational research or like teaching. And perhaps this is why we are all here today. Um, so this is important to realize that the same thing happens with our students, whether they are, you know, we kids, like you know, primary school kids or adults or like anything, you know, along the continuum. So how could we define, if we can, um, diversity? And this comes from this book I co-edited with two lovely colleagues from Argentina. And so in this chapter, we say, well, from a social, ju uh, social justice perspective, the notion of diversity is reoriented to recognize inequality, mitigate the consequences of exclusion and dismantle injustice. So what happens with diversity is that we, there are two processes here, if I may. One is to recognize that we've got problems, to recognize, to acknowledge, to admit that sometimes 
not necessarily ourselves, but educational systems do not include necessarily everyone. So we recognize that, and then we work towards changing that situation. And this is where we uh, reorient practices, we reorient policies. And of course, this is something that we cannot do on our own and individually, because then we need institutional support, community support, colleague support. But this doesn't mean that we cannot do it. Otherwise, it's always easy to say, well, I can't do it because then I need someone else's help. And then that someone will say, no, we can't do this because we still need someone else's help higher up the hierarchy, and then no one does anything. So uh, it's okay to start with um, small scale initiatives that you can uh, manage yourselves. So with this in mind, if we once the conversation about diversity becomes systematic, becomes second nature, right? Once we do it more often, and then this becomes a feature of our teaching. So it's not that once a month we just do something tokenistic about diversity, but if we, once it becomes, even if that's the way we start, that's fine, but once it becomes systematic, and it becomes ingrained, embedded in our teaching, then we will be talking about inclusion. And um, this is important to address because what we want to do with inclusion is we want to increase participation of absolutely everyone in the classroom, decision-making, etc. right? We want to remove all barriers, that is to say, all obstacles, situations, beliefs, or practices that somehow impede that some people have equitable and quality access to education and to um, educational provision. Think about what happened when we have to migrate with different degrees of success from face-to-face -face teaching to online teaching, right? Let's think about all the students who for different reasons became all of a sudden excluded from educational provision because they didn't have a Wi-Fi connectivity at home or they didn't have maybe a personal laptop computer or a device. Maybe they only had one computer that all the family had to share so these are the situations where inclusion like slaps us on the face. And together with that, you know, when we talk about inclusion, it is about equity and quality support for all. So if some students need extra support, so this is where we jump in with different strategies that we will develop ourselves because you as teachers know what works and what doesn't work in the classroom. So I am not here to give you recipes about how to promote diversity or how to promote inclusion, uh, because you are experts in your context. So you know what works, you know what doesn't. And this topic of inclusion can help us bring into the classroom some ideas or some notions that are social issues that have an impact or may have an impact on our students and perhaps with students older ones. Um, and I remember the situation, do you remember when in the States, um, this movement, all Black Lives, uh, sorry, Black Lives Matter started. And then some people started saying, well, hang on a minute, like all lives matter. Right. The problem was, and this is interesting to discuss with students. Yes, all lives matter. That's that's all right. But the thing is that until then, black lives did not matter. So this is why you are in a way uh, selecting one specific group of people because history and facts will tell you 
that it is not true that all lives matter. Some lives matter more than others. So this, you know, these are the conversations that we may want to include in the classroom. Because, you know, they, they will see this uh, online, they will see this on social media, and these are the topics that we may want to discuss and unpick with students. So, um, when we put all these concepts together, we can think about four main areas. So, one is we could exercise diversity and inclusion by looking at the learning environment, whether it is physical, you know, face-to-face -face space, or whether it is a hybrid situation, or whether it is something entirely online. So are we making sure that everyone's got access? Are we making sure that, for example, if you upload a video, maybe you have recorded yourself, that um, your video has automatic subtitles? so that people, students can, um, can listen, watch and read in case they have problems. Or if that uses too much data, do we have maybe the transcript elsewhere? Or do we have the, um, the tasks, you know, the instructions written in Spanish so that parents can help them. Because this is something that a few months ago I heard from a colleague back in Argentina saying that parents felt really bad because they were unable to help their kids with English because the teachers would send everything in English so they didn't know how to help them, how to help their own children. So, of course, this means more work. Um, but once it becomes naturalized, then it is less of an issue. Because if we have, for example, and I've seen this uh, among teachers that they create maybe a one pager with instructions in English and Spanish, and those instructions are usually repeated throughout the term. So they do it once, and then that helps both students and teacher and, and parents. Then diversity and inclusion in the in, uh, curricula. So the different curricula. So in your own curriculum, um, do you have topics that, for example, address what happens in your area? Do you have topics that address um, what students are interested in, what the community demands that should be addressed? In terms of resources, same thing. Do we have resources that are context responsive? Or do we need, do we really need resources? Can we do more with less? Is it okay to work with students to develop our own resources? You know, the students developing, designing different board games and then they exchange them and they play something that with a language learning objective, let's just say. And in the case of assessment, and again, this is always the elephant in the room. Um, if we have been working on diversity throughout the year, how is that reflected in assessment? Are all students assessed exactly the same way, even when their learning trajectories have been different? Or do we have, for example, some level of compromise where there's a core element in that assessment, like every student's got to do this, but then there is another element where students choose from maybe a set of five activities or five assignments, they choose one to complete. And this is where we can talk about like formative assessment rather than summative assessment. And at this very moment, there's a conference in Argentina, the FAP conference on assessment in ELT. That's the main topic of the conference this year. So this is something to think about. Uh, do we really need to exercise this level of control that someone's got to be checking on the students you know, for fear that they cheat? Or can we think about exercises or activities which are simple, but will allow students to display 
their genuine knowledge of English. So that's one area to think about. And this is, as you can see, this is a macro uh, dimension of diversity and inclusion. Another area to look at is what we may call plural literacies for deeper learning. And this is the clear <laughs> part of me. Um, and what uh, Coyle and Mayer mean by plural literacies is enabling learners to use all the languages they know, all the genres they know, all the, um, all the knowledge they have, regardless of the language. So it is a mixture of translanguaging, but it is also an invitation to allow students to use different registers when they express their thoughts so that their, say, temporary inability to say something in English does not deprive them from participation because they want to mean something and maybe they don't have the forms for it. So it's fine if they say that in, in Spanish and then we somehow help them say that in English. But through that situation, we are walking our talk about saying, you know, meaning is more important. This doesn't mean that form is not important, but we are priori prioritizing meaning because if we don't allow students to participate or we only allow them to participate if they use English, then we are missing the chance and we are, again, excluding them from participation. And the ones who will participate are the ones that usually participate because they are more vocal or they feel more confident about their English language proficiency. And another thing to think about here is that when we throw in a question, maybe students are not working groups, so I am working with the whole group of students. When we throw in a question, this idea of thinking time, so I'm going to tell students, so I'm going to ask you a question, but I will give you 30 seconds to think. And then I will invite some of you to answer that question. And in so doing, we are allowing everyone to come up with an answer. Otherwise, the same thing will happen. The, the, the usual suspects will steal the show answering the question. And so the others, once you know the answer is there, then the others will not bother. So why, why should I bother when this you know, guy has already answered the question? The third area is intercultural understanding. So when we talk about diversity, we need to think about intercultural understanding. And intercultural understanding means becoming aware of otherness, others' uh, practices, cultural practices. This could be another country or regions as well in the world, again, without stereotyping, say, you know, American people do this, or, you know, in England, people have five o'clock tea, but you all know that that's only for tourists. No one has five o'clock tea. Uh, so it is about other countries, but I would say primarily, it is about intercultural understanding within Adam House. So, for example, um, can we talk about intercultural practices within Bogota, within the different neighborhoods of Bogota? Can we talk about um, intercultural practices within the country, within you know, people from the coast, people from um, deep down Colombia, um, people from small cities, rural um, Colombia, et cetera, or anywhere else in South America? And this is interesting because this is when students begin to realize that there is so much diversity within their own cities and things that they take for granted, you know, aspects that they believe that are unequivocally shared, sorry about shared by everyone. It is not always the case. It happened to us, you know, I don't know if you're aware, uh, Jimena will, um, 
like mate is such a popular drink in Argentina. This doesn't mean that everyone drinks mate. There are some people who don't like it. And that's all right. You know, it's fine. Oh, we have this popular alcoholic beverage called Fernet from Córdoba, from where Mena is, that province. And again, not everyone likes it because some people find it bitter. Uh, I've uh, once I made Fernet for some colleagues here in school, some of them liked it. Some others were politically correct. <laughs> you say, okay, well, it's, it's all right. Saying this is, ah. <laughs> but again, this gives students ideas about recognizing intercultural diversity within uh, their own contexts. And when we talk about intercultural understanding, we also, we also talk about all those cultural constructs that we have naturalized, but they are the products of um, hegemonic practices. So this is when we talk about gender and sexuality. So in some cases, notions of gender diversity or sexuality or sexual orientation are contained within cultural practices or intercultural understanding because concepts of heteronormativity are cultural or ideas of um, patriarchal structures are also cultural. So these are important topics to address, important topics to let students become aware of, not necessarily by putting them in the spotlight, but raising awareness about topics that are already present out there, let's say, outside the school, already present in society, in their families, home, social media, particularly. Um, so these are the topics that we need to bring in into the classroom more often. And my last area, I would say, is special education needs. And this is perhaps, uh, correct me if, if I'm wrong, but this is at least... This is what I feel myself. This is the area that we as teachers of English are less confident about, because in my case, I have never received any formal training or back in the day, 100 years ago when I did my uh, professorado, I never received any formal training on special education needs. And, um, and I must recognize that it is not something that I have pursued myself because I can say, well, the government has not provided me with any training, but maybe there are some opportunities out there that I don't take anyways. So this is, again, my, my own responsibility. But this is an area that maybe it's lacking because or we don't have the training or maybe because there isn't any systematic quality training that talks about special education needs for language education. Right? I completed a few years ago a short course on special education needs, but this was like general, let's say, for all kinds of educators. And then it's up to us perhaps to see how we could adapt uh, those recommendations to teach. I, oh, someone is, <laughs> well, wrong time. Um, to, to put them into practice, into, into TESOL. I don't know who that person might be. It must be the, I'm thinking, well, I don't know who that person could be. Um, if we talk about empowerment and if we talk about how we could empower uh, ourselves, other colleagues to address diversity in ELT, we could start by revisiting our own current beliefs and practice. Are we ready to do this? Are we ready to um, incorporate this perspective, right? And um, so if we think about this, so what aims do I want to have? And this is of course central when we do any planning or any teaching, right? What aims do I want to pursue? What do I want to achieve? What are the language learning outcomes that I want my students to achieve when I start to embed a diversity 
inclusion agenda in my teaching? What kind of feedback can I ask? Students or colleagues or someone else. Do I have the space, organizationally speaking, to carry out these activities? Or how can I do this anyways with what I have? Because this is another thing that sometimes happens to us. Then we don't do anything because we don't have the space. But that's the space we have. And so we've got to make do with whatever we have. And I'm telling you and now from experience that even in contexts like this one in Glasgow, what you might say, well, you know, we do have more resources. People have the same complaints. <laughs> they don't have enough space. They don't have enough resources. There aren't enough computers. There aren't enough, you know, pens and pencils for students. So it is a matter of um, maximizing the, um, the resources that we have, because maybe in comparison to other contexts, we have a lot. Ask and let do. And why am I bringing this up? Because even though we may agree, of course, on, um, on diversity and inclusion, it is true that we belong to different um, institutions. And sometimes institutions may have a very clear uh, policy, a very clear vision about these topics. So I recognize that Sometimes issues, for example, around diversity in terms of like gender diversity or sexuality may be uh, sensitive topics in some institutions. But I think it is okay to ask, to avoid any frictions, of course, to maybe come to a compromise. And if you are in a position where you are managing other people, then maybe it is time for us to let other people do and let's see what the outcome is and what new language learning opportunities are displayed for students. And so here, perhaps, if we think about um, empowering, well, we could empower students by, as I said before, um, asking them to create student-made resources, which are based on a project, or we could invite students to carry out projects through inquiry-based learning, something, uh, let's say, something local, something about local practices, uh, famous places in their town or people, you know, there are, or every town has its own characters or uh, history or um, long-standing shops or whatever it is that is local. And we could empower families and students by involving even grandparents, you know, grandparents as storytellers. And grandparents could talk about their past in, in Spanish or whatever the language is. And then we could work with that material to do some English teaching. And another important aspect to remember here is to talk about sustainability. So how can we make this um, present over time. So I would say that we need to go little by little. We don't need to, we don't want to um, do something grand. And my, at least in my experience, is that when you want to go too big and then it doesn't work, it becomes so frustrating that then you don't want to do it again. Whereas if you do one small project today and then something small the following day or the following lesson or next week, you make this small change, even if you have a course book, right? But then you make a twist to one activity, an activity that is very stereotypical about tourists or very stereotypical about um, what women like or what men like or kind of professions, um, men and women, if this is like binary, I recognize that. Um, like So maybe small changes. So that's one thing to think about. And then we could go from explicit to implicit diversity and exclusion. This is um, what I mean by sometimes talking about diversity issues, but then this shouldn't like die there. So once we unmask and veil the issues around diversity and inclusion, 
then we do that more often and then it becomes ingrained in our teaching. And as we do this, I think it is important to use what we already have and reflect on new avenues. So rather than finding like new materials all the time, which you can do naturally, um, but maybe it might be a good idea to start off with what you have already. Let's see what the course book brings. Let's see what students say in class and how I can turn that into a language learning opportunity. And by language learning, I just don't mean form and language, but meaning and content and values around diversity and inclusion encoded in English. If we think about engage, well, we could engage so many people here. First of all, we could engage people by asking. I love asking. Yeah. So when I have an idea, which are not usually <laughs> big ideas, they're usually small ideas, um, I ask people, I approach people I know, people I don't, I, you know, as we say in Spanish, el no ya lo tenés. Well, same thing here. People can always say no, and that's okay. But I ask students, say, do you think we could do this? Or would you like to do something around this topic? Or shall we make a change? And now we will be doing this in such and such ways. So you ask students, you ask colleagues, say you don't want to work alone on something, so you ask another colleague. And say, you know, shall we plan a project or shall we plan a lesson or something that brings at least like two classes together? Something small from the same school, from different schools, and then we engage the family. So, you know, we will be talking about this topic, say, uh, childhood. And there are brilliant projects around funds of identity. And when um, you ask students to talk about their identity, you are bringing in diversity in so many ways because it is about uh, their grandparents, stories, things they like, things they didn't quite like. In some cases, this could be um, a bit sensitive depending on um, childhood experiences. But again, it's up to you, of course, as uh, professionals to uh, leverage the, uh, the topics. And you can ask the community, say, you have a project about um, cleaning the environment, the streets, and this is cultural. So this is diversity and inclusion by all means. So you say, well, you know, we want to have um, volunteers for this project who would like to become part of it with all the necessary permissions, institutional permissions that goes with that saying. So as you ask students, you can also ask yourself, am I enjoying this? How can I make it um, work more and more? Um, what is this telling me about my own teaching, my own practice? Uh, how is this changing the way I see education, I see language teaching, I see language learning? And as I say there, ask your practice, this is about reflective practice. So it's about maybe keeping a journal that it could be written or it could be yourself, you know, audio recording with your mobile phone, your thoughts, ideas, your insights. And as you become systematic about this, then you note the good things about your initiatives, what might need to be changed. So you do this asking, doing, and evaluating. And depending on the outcomes, well, you may want to make a few tweaks here and there and repeat. And this is how we start transforming our practices in such a way that they empower and engage people. And if we talk about extend, we can think about different projects. And even if they are in nature small, you can work within your school. As I said before, with another colleague, another class, or I've seen lovely projects. And actually in this book, uh, um, International Perspectives on Diversity in LT, there's this beautiful project between primary and secondary school students within the same school. So it could be within you know, the same class, with another class or the transition perhaps when students move from primary to secondary 
or even like kindergarten to primary, or in some cases from secondary to uh, university, interschool, within your city, within your country. And sometimes we have these projects, you know, remember in the good old days, pen pal projects with students from other countries, usually native speakers. However, there are wonderful projects where um, students are paired up with students from another part of the same country or from another country that also has English as an additional language. So it doesn't have to be necessarily, you know, a student from Medellin with a student from Glasgow. It could be with another student, with another class from, I don't know, Bukaramanga or from Bangladesh for that matter, because what we are aiming at here is we are aiming at intercultural understanding and the realization and the celebration of difference and diversity. And as you do this, you go beyond your borders, but not only geographical or physical, but also at social borders so that students get to experience different realities and they get to recognize and uh, become aware of differences and how valid and equal all these differences are. So this is the important message here, that as we extend the notions of diversity and inclusion, then we ask learners, we invite learners and ourselves, naturally as teachers, um, to you know, carry out these practices. So what um, maybe we can do this um, again using the, uh, the chat box and YouTube in one minute. Can you share one idea that you have, one simple activity, something that you would like to do, something that you have already done, something that somehow taps into diversity and inclusion, right? So any, any teaching strategy, any activity that you have carried out with your students that taps into that addresses um, diversity and inclusion. Thank you, Berta. So Berta says, work with students in rural institutions. That's lovely, that's perfect. Yes, that's wonderful. Let me have some of my onion tea. Pen pal letters between college students and rural elementary students. Oh, this is lovely. Thank you, Anna. You know, this reminds me, many years ago, this reminds me of a project, a wee project, nothing fancy. A wee project where um, secondary school students would create their own short stories and they would go to um, a kindergarten close to the school and would tell the stories, their own stories, to the kids. It was lovely. Thank you. Lady mapping, designing, and enacting a plan to solve a local problem. Oh, that's grand. That's amazing. Yes. And that's, you know, context responsive in the making. Analyzing movies that depict stories of underrepresented uh, populations. Yes. Oh, that's thank you, Carlo working on raising awareness through contextualized materials. Indeed, thank you, Jonathan. Giving opinions on a subject matter, yes. You know, the other day, I, I am part of this large Facebook group called Teacher Voices. And one teacher asked, is it okay to discuss in class um, controversial issues, such as you know, politics and drugs and... Um, sexual diversity, blah, blah, blah. And 
the number of answers that that postcodes um, tell you volumes about diversity. Because some people were like, why not? What well, the problem is, and this was pretty much like European context or Latin America, and in some of the context, well, well, it depends. These are like very sensitive topics, etc. So again, that tells you that all these topics are like culturally um, situated. Taking into account QLF when planning my classes as a pre-service English and Spanish teacher. Thank you. Julia, analyzing content of songs, lovely. Yeah, common sense, which is not the, the most uh, common sense at all. Okay, let's move further. And um, you can, then we can come back to, um, to more stories. So my, uh, <clears throat> my interest here is like this extending um, perpetually, if you will, um, because that's the best way to carry on doing all this, to carry on um, enacting and doing diversity and inclusion. So it begins with us in our own practice. It starts with us, with us wanting to do it um, because it is the student's right. Uh, it is our right, perhaps to address these issues, particularly when we say that we want to um, contribute to the generation or the development of critical thinkers, right? So if we have that critical thinking orientation, then I am afraid to say that we cannot sweep under the carpet issues around diversity and, and inclusion. And as we do this, so we might start to do this on our own or perhaps with a colleague or two, but wouldn't it be just lovely to work together within communities of practice? So a group of other teachers within the same school, from different schools, or think about a teaching association. And you suggest this topic and perhaps you create a smaller network of teachers and this community of practice begins to develop notions, um, lesson plans, resources, or a project that brings these teachers together. And then you put this into practice and you see what happens. It doesn't have to be 100% successful. It doesn't have to last for months. It could be maybe a one-off thing. And then you evaluate how that went. And then based on that, you may want to do, to do it again or to make a few changes and do it uh, elsewhere, or maybe in the second term, etc. So as you work in this community of practice, and maybe this community of practice branches out into other communities of practice elsewhere within the same city or across cities within the country or across countries as well, then the teachers will be amassing, you know, gathering topics. Uh, as all the topics that you colleagues have wonderfully mentioned uh, in the chat box, lesson plans, continuing professional development opportunities. You can say, you know, I know that there's this webinar, free, web even if it's free, that's a lot better, a free webinar on, I don't know what, a topic on decolonizing the curriculum, for example, decolonizing language teaching. And it's... Uh, in Argentina, or it's in Uruguay, or it's in Colombia, it's in Chile, or it's like elsewhere, it's in the UK for that matter. Um, and so it's a matter of sharing, we just share. And then if people say that, then that's wonderful. And if they don't, that's okay, because there's always someone who will say, oh, I will click on this link and see what happens. And uh, so there's always that. So we can always reach out, we can always, um, make practices and make these ideas resonate with other contexts and have an impact, whatever the impact is on, on other people. Um, I should be shutting this big mouth of mine. And I would like to close with this quote again from the same uh, volume I mentioned before. And it goes like this. Let's celebrate diversity 
by making it possible in contexts where diversity is hidden, silenced. The need for embracing diversity can be literally found round the corner from our home. So this is my invitation today. Let's walk the extra mile and let's address diversity where diversity is not present, where diversity is ignored, let's say, where diversity is criminalized even socially. And, um, because that's the challenge, to bring this up, to change the curriculum, to engage in emancipatory practices that we can sustain within the continent. So this is all from me. I think we've got five minutes for questions. Um, Marta, okay, thank, thank you, you very you. much indeed. Thank you very much for that wonderful presentation, Dr. Vanegas. Um, I think this helped us a lot to better understand and comprehend what diversity means. I also would like to highlight uh, when you mentioned that uh, maybe um, those small initiatives that we may have as educators are the ones that can make a change and that can help us um, like to continue walking the path, as you mentioned. We are uh, receiving a lot of comments uh, in our chat, but before doing that, uh, I, I am happy to tell you that we have people um, joining us today from Villa Maria, Argentina, from mm -hmm, Mendoza, yes. Argentina as well, from Barranca Bermeja, Tunja, Guaguatá, Bogotá, Oicata, Pasto, Miraflores, Villa de Leyva, Sogamoso, and so on. So we are very happy. Look at all that diversity. And you know, the funny thing is that every time you, you talk about these places, you mention them, I'm thinking about the lovely food they must have. <laughs> so you, you so need to come my... and visit all of us. <coughs> and you will see. That's my association for interculturality. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Okay. Now I'm going to read some of the comments that we have on the chat. We have a comment from Professor Ali Darisa, and she says, special needs is an area that has been frequently disregarded in EFL undergraduate teacher education programs curricula and also practices in Colombia. And then she says, uh, in that sense, there is a need to include this topic as part of our research curiosity. Yes, absolutely. And... Uh, this is a bit of self-promotion, but <laughs> this is the book that uh, we published this year. And, you know, the book has three sections, interculturality, special education needs, and gender. It was hard to find contributors for the special education needs section. And most of the contributions would be around dyslexic, students. So within that um, lack of, of interest, let's say, at least research interest or something that gets published, which doesn't necessarily represent what happens in practice, uh, goes without saying. Um, but then there was most of the interested people had done something along the lines of dyslexia. And that was that. And there were and those who had, the, uh, their projects were only in university level, nothing with uh, primary school kids, you know, young learners or teenagers. So, yes, that's absolutely right. Unfortunately, um, it's lacking. But again, that's an opportunity um, to work uh, with colleagues who are more uh, formally trained in that area, to work um, with them and do something that we can benefit from in TESOL, yeah, definitely. Okay, Professor Darío, we have also a comment from Jimena Serrato. She says, I, I agree in the sense that we need to learn to maximize our resources. Perhaps it, it is easy to complain or to wait to be, to be given resources. Um, oh yes, absolutely, yes. You know, because when we complain, we somehow, and probably will not be that popular with this comment, but when we complain, we somehow like take off the responsibility off my back, you know, el gobierno, no, porque el gobierno no tiene que... So we all know the tango, we all know that it's a broken record. And 
Um, but, but I don't mean that we've got to fund that ourselves as teachers. But maybe it is just a matter of, like as we said before, using the resources we have, even if it is old course books and that's it. And this is, I don't know if some of you are um, familiar with this movement that's not high out, died out today, but not today. Um, uh, what is it called? Um, Dogme, Dogme ELT, that was doing ELT with as little as possible. And Dogme ELT was spearheaded by Scott Thunbury. And the idea was to create your lessons around students' stories, what students bring in on a daily basis to the classroom. So like no physical resources, if you will. But yes. That's right. Okay, Sandra Silva says, Professor Sandra Silva says, thank you, Dr. Vanegas. Great talk about inclusive practices and strategies in the EFL classroom. Jimena Serrato uh, goes on and saying, encouraging trainees to the teaching practice in peripheral schools as part of volunteer work, for example. That's a, a, yes. a proposal. Yes, uh, and this reminds me of something kind of terrible um, that happened back in the day when I did my practicum in my professorado. The best student teachers were sent to the best schools in town for the practicum. And the worst, let's say, academically speaking, right, were sent to the um, rural schools or schools in the suburban areas, which is horrific. And this is what happened. But at the time, we were all like stupid enough not to realize, um, excuse my language, but then, you know, when you realize years later, they say, really? <laughs> but it's a good thing that we realize because that shows that we have grown. Uh, Anna says, uh, so the, um, the book is called International Perspectives on Diversity and ELT. This is uh, published by Palgrave. Okay. Then I might share a wee, a wee something that with you, and perhaps you can share that wee something with the people who are participating today. Okay. Sure, please. A wee something from the book. Yeah. Please, we can yeah. send them a, all the information related to the book. Just to close uh, this first talk, uh, we have a comment from Professor Julia Elvira Martinez, and she says, thank you very much, Dr. Vanegas. Andrea Galindo, thank you very much. She agrees with the importance of addressing these issues related to diversity, identities, and inclusion from our own contexts. Um, uh, oh, and by the way, we have, I'm sorry for the blah. Don't worry. <laughs> the interruption. We have this wonderful chapter now, The Penny Drops by Carlo, Carlo Granado, who is here with us today, on, I'm trying to, oh, I'm not that young enough anymore, I need my glasses. Um, promoting understanding of diversity by taking a critical intercultural stance. And so the chapter is based on how he addressed a critical perspective of interculturality in teacher education, in higher education. And that's a beautiful chapter because it is so much based in Latin American epistemology. And this is a recognition of the knowledge we create in our own continent without, you know, always trotting on what people based elsewhere uh, write. Okay. okay, thank you very much. <laughs> well, um, Professor Jorge sanchez Abudin says, thank you very much, Dr. Vanegas, for this excellent talk. And, and if you want, we uh, can close this part of the session with a question, a very interesting and difficult question. So I'm, I'm you? telling you this, <laughs> which is <laughs> what <laughs> What would you say are good ways to stop letting our own personal biases impede our assessing students accurately? My own personal biases. Well, that's a good start because you have already acknowledged that you have your own, um, your own bias. Uh, but, but that's, your, you know, like your personal me. You recognize that. But when... I go into a classroom, it is not my personal agenda or my personal beliefs what drive me, it is my professional beliefs. 
on it. And I always tell this story, and if you have heard me talk about diversity, you've been like, here we go again. I have this wonderful, amazing colleague of mine back in Esquel, small town, lovely town, gorgeous place in Patagonia. And she's um, a Christian colleague who is dead against abortion, for example. And nevertheless, she allowed her classroom and we even co-taught a lesson on abortion and other topics um, in her own classroom. The students knew what her stance was, but that didn't stop her from teaching, let's say from a, from a more objective perspective, say, you know, these are the options or these are the different narratives or discourses that we have, people for, because of X, Y, Z, people against because of X, Y, Z. And she gave them an amazing example of critical thinking. So, you know, these are my personal beliefs. These are my personal beliefs, but let's open up the floor so that we listen to all the representations, all the voices out there. And that was a perfect example. So of like, you know, recognizing your biases, communicating them to your students and say, okay, now the drama is over. Let's do this critically and intersubjectively, if you will, so that she respected the student's rights, basically. Thank you very much, Dr. Vanegas, for that wonderful answer to a very um, complicated question, I would say. Oh, yes, I know it's... I, I, it is complex and it is complicated. And I was fortunate enough to find this wonderful teacher, but I don't know what, what I would do if I had the opposite of saying, thank you very much. But no, <laughs> door slammed on my face. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. I think um, it is our time for today. Uh, thank you again for joining us today. We hope um, you continue having a wonderful day. Well, I'm, I'm actually I'm planning to see Carolina's presentation, if you don't mind. And then of course. Yes, I'll go back to, back to my writing. Boring Fridays for me. <laughs> you are more than welcome. And of course, uh, hopefully, we can have you here in, in, in Tunja, in Boyacá, next year. Oh, yes. Yes. But physically present so that we go and enjoy the lovely food. So you see, that's all. <laughs> this is my motivation, <laughs> my professional motivation. Okay. okay. Anyway, well, thank, thank you very much for the. This has been a wonderful time. Thank you very much for the invite, Berta, and uh, hope that you all enjoy the uh, the mood. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Now we continue, uh, but before going with our next uh, presenter, I would like to remind you that we have uh, a YouTube chat in which you can leave all your messages, uh, your questions for the presenters your comments, and now we are going to continue with our next uh, keynote speakers. So we have Professor Carolina Huitrago and Professor Marta Ramirez, who will be uh, talking and sharing their experiences in, in terms of flipping mm -hmm. content intentionally, sharing their audition perspectives. Professor Carolina Rodriguez Huitrago, is a full-time professor at Institución Universitaria Colombo-Americana Unica. She has worked as a teacher for almost 20 years and has held different positions in the academic field. Recognized for her work in Flip Learning by Flip Learning Global Initiative, and Carolina is currently a member of the board of the Flip Learning Network. Professor Marta Ramirez is a professor in the Languages and Culture Department at Universidad de los Andes, Colombia. As a Flip learning expert. She has collaborated with different institutions at a national and international level. Her main contribution to the field has been the further development of the concept of in-class flip alongside Carolina Buitra. Uh, so you are very welcome. Thank you very much for being with us today. And before starting, uh, just for a reminder for the audience, don't forget your questions, your comments, to sign up for the certificate. So the floor is all yours, Professors uh, Carolina and uh, Professor Marta. Welcome. 
Thank you, Dr. Ramos. Thank you very much. Um, it's a great honor to be here. I know uh, the teacher's mood is a very, um, is a place that we hold dear to our hearts. This is my second teacher's mood, and I'm sure Marta's too. <laughs> so we, we'd love to be here sharing with you again. Uh, thank you very much, Dario, for that presentation, and thank you for staying for our talk. Um, I'm really happy to have one of your hours uh, I, I always wonder how you keep publishing so much. It's, it's the magic of Fridays, I guess. Okay, so Marta, um, want to say hello? Hi, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for this invitation. Yes, it is, uh, I, I believe, my third uh, time participating in the Teacher's Moot. And it's always an honor to share the floor with such great educators and today with my colleague and dear friend, Carolina. So we're, we're going to be talking to you about uh, flipping content intentionally. And um, well, the main objective is to share, you know, what it is that we're doing as educators that have been flipping for quite a, a good number of years. OK, so let's let's get started. So we were already introduced uh, to you, I think, uh, the, the key information we can say, or at least in my case, is that I have been flipping for about seven years. My home base uh, as an educator has been Universidad de los Andes for uh, four years, but um, I also teach with UPTC, um, so I hold UPTC deeply in my heart. And I have been flipping since uh, 2014. Um, I don't know how many years that is. I lost track of time, but it seems like uh, once you flip, you never go back. My home base is Institución Universitaria Colombo Americana Unica. Uh, five years ago, I also have taught in UPTC um, at least sometimes. But anyway, it's always very, very. Um, it's great. I'm so nervous. This is such a great place that yeah, I get a little nervous every time. Um, also, I know that he is watching. <laughs> so it's a great place to be. And it's great to see 61 people connected, all the students in the masters. And hopefully, well, uh, we have some reflections and we share some ideas about what we have learned um, about intentionality in content. So what are we going to do today, Marta? Can you walk us through the agenda? Yes. So uh, we've divided today's presentation in five parts. First, we're gonna talk a little bit about what it means, um, what we mean by intentional content, and uh, we'll make the connection with flipped learning, of course. And then uh, according to uh, uh, the pillar of intentional content, we've divided in uh, prioritizing concepts, uh, creating or curation, and we'll share with you a little bit like what it is that we're doing, um, what our perceptions are in this regard, and finally, how, we're, how we differentiate content. And we'll leave some minutes to answer questions from the audience. OK, so we're going to start with a question that we would very much love for you to answer on the chat box in YouTube. And it is, uh, what does it mean now? What does intentional content mean now, 2021, after 2020, after COVID? Uh, what does it mean for you uh, when you read the words intentional content? So I know it's going to take a little bit uh, for us, you know, for the answers to come through the chat. So um, in the meantime, we can tell you that flip learning is something that we have been doing since Marta said seven years ago. I said probably six years ago, seven years ago, too. And the thing about flipping is that you shift. You make some shifts. You um, it's not only about videos, it's not only about materials, it's about a mindset shift where you put students at the center of the learning process and where you make decisions intentionally about what is going to be learned, how you're going to assess, who is going to participate, who makes decisions. Everything becomes intentional when you flip. And so flip learning, yes, there is a basic of, you know, let's invert classroom time and um, individual space time and some activities that we do in the at home and in the classroom. But basically what we actually flip is our mindset. It's uh, our roles as teachers. We relinquish control. 
we put students on the center, we let them be, right? So in, in this in this framework that I'm, I'm sharing, what do you think is intentional content and what does intentional content mean for you? Okay, so um, we still have the question going on in the chat. I guess the delay is longer than 30 seconds. So Marta, is there anything you want to say about flipping so that we can give time for people to answer the question? Um, I'm thinking maybe maybe um, our audience is kind of really pondering <laughs> on what this means. And, and maybe just, just to clarify, the question is uh, like, how has the way that we approach content changed due to the pandemic i think maybe that could that could help a little bit to to rethink uh the question i think we're starting to get some answers in the chat so let, let me read that to you carolina um so andy juliana says intentional content uh lends itself to be applied by students in a myriad of situations for example it's relevant outside the classroom Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's really keeping us thinking. It is. So, well, I what I think what I highlight from uh, what Juliana is saying is um, definitely uh, the the pandemic has led us to think of different spaces, right? Because we used to be only in that face-to-face, -face, uh, I mean, for those of us who were teaching in face-to-face -face, uh, settings, I guess thinking like what happens outside or what happens like out of that specific setting was not so evident to us until, you know, the, the we were, everything was being connected, right? <laughs> like we were at home all the time. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Carlo, my dearest Boston friend <laughs> says, um, asking myself what is essential that I need to teach and what can be spared. Yeah, decision making, right? What is really needed for students to be tied and what is something that I can just um, disregard or simply uh, leave for another moment or another space, right? Great. Okay, so more answers are coming through. We have Jay says, content you extra prepare intentionally based on what you need for your class. Um, I, I like the emphasis on you extra prepare, <laughs> right? I guess that's something that COVID kind of pushed us to do. Um, and Dr. Uh, Ramos says in the chat here in Zoom that she had never thought about it. <laughs> so that's, that's also great. That's also great. So I think we're ready to move on with these ideas. And to say that definitely, yes, foreign teaching taught us about intentionality. As Carlo pointed out, uh, we are now making um, stronger decisions on what needs to go inside the classroom and what definitely needs to go outside. Maybe not now when people are moving back to some face-to-face uh, -face teaching, but back in 2020, March 2020, when we had students at a very limited time, some institutions did not even have a um, synchronous platform like Zoom, Meet, or Teams that they could meet their students at. We started uh, experiencing many difficulties with um, access. We started to reveal, or you know, the pandemic revealed all this inequality that we live in our educational system, and also the diversity that Daniel was talking about. There were students living two or three families in the same house, not enough internet access, um, teachers only with WhatsApp as a means to communicate with students. So there were so many external factors that led us to make decisions and to say, well, this has to stay, but this can go, this can move away, this can, I, I can prepare this other type of activity to make sure that my students get this content. But in general, we were uh, questioning intentionality. We were questioning what definitely needs to go inside the classroom and what needs to go outside. So in, in our case, uh, we started, of, of course, as teachers, Marta and I, 
we also started making decisions as to what we needed to teach and where. And so, for example, we decided to flip content. Right now, I am teaching academic writing and research uh, methodology. And so what I did, what I flipped was I definitely had to get out of my classroom organizational strategies, procedures, steps, you know, processes. Uh, instructions. I was not going to uh, spend my time in Zoom with my students just giving instructions. Uh, explanations, for example, I'll show you some examples later, but I teach the literature review. My researchers out there, you know, that's not an easy topic. And so explaining something like that in a two-hour session, when you have a student living in San Andres, another student living in Caquetá with very limited connectivity, is, is just not fair. So I flipped my explanations and also technical information, things about uh, websites, tutorials, things that could help them uh, improve the learning process. What about you, Marta? What did you flip in your language class? Well, um, I'm teaching uh, advanced English uh, right now and also academic writing and academic speaking. So I think like the differences uh, from what you are flipping would be because I'm teaching English as well, you know, the grammar, the listening, the vocabulary explanations. Um, I know we both flip concepts. Um, I guess that would go also in the technical information that you have. And something else is that I uh, was actually using a textbook uh, in one of my classes. So I used the material or the explanations within the textbook and I would uh, you know, make them accessible to students through our teaching flat platform so they could prepare it. And then we can, you know, get down to business of application when we met in the synchronous classes. Okay, so flipped learning definitely prepared us for the challenge. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm going to sound a little bit, uh, I don't know, maybe at the risk of being cocky, but uh, the ones who had been flipping for some years, you know, we already had a bunch of videos made. We already had a lot of stuff that we had created at like HyperDocs or other types of lessons. So it wasn't really that bad of a transition for us. Um, we had already started, you know, getting ourselves out of the synchronous phase of the classroom and letting students be the main actors in class. So for us, that was not so difficult. And I mean, for us, the flippers, you know, the people who had already started to flip. However, we were usually the lone wolves in our institutions at the very beginning. Um, not in Unica, I got a, a lot of support from all the institution, but before it was like, yeah, you know what? Yeah, that's okay. We do things this way here. You know, in this institution, we teach in front of the class. We, the teacher, we are the ones doing the teaching, not through videos or this other thing. Or, you know, different institutions had different regulations about homework uh, that you could never send something for students to watch at home. So it was a difficult situation, a difficult transition. The more traditional the teaching you did, the more difficult the transition uh, during COVID. So definitely uh, this prepared us. And the idea is, remember, just switching, shifting the roles. What do you do in class? What do you do before class? And what do your students do inside the classroom, be it online or face-to-face? -face? So if you think about flipped learning as a way, as, an, as a pedagogical approach, it was very helpful before the pandemic because Marta and I started flipping way before, uh, but the pandemic revealed how important it is to give student autonomy, to put students at the center of the process, to really create good rubrics and checklists that can inform students of what you are expecting from them. And all of that is done um, when you flip your class. So it's a win-win situation. And if you decide to start now, if you're a newbie on flip learning, it's going to be beneficial for you, uh, regardless of the situation you're teaching in. There we go. Okay, so we're gonna talk about, okay, intentional content. And you know, you might be asking like, where does this come from? So the Flip Learning Network um, provides four pillars 
for flipped learning as an approach, which are flexible environment, learning culture, intentional content, and professional educator. For the purpose of today's presentation, we're only going to talk about intentional content and clarify a little bit what these, um, you know, what this uh, pillar contains in terms of the indicators. So there are three indicators. Uh, the first one, and you'll see it's connected to our agenda, is prioritizing concepts used in direct instructions for learners to access on their own. So the content that I usually tend to explain or tend to teach or tend to talk about, right? That's the direct instruction. Um, here, the, the indicator is, you know, how I choose certain concepts to flip, right? So that students can have that access. And I think in pandemic, that came very obvious because of maybe the lack of connection or, you know, some students had would connect, disconnect, et cetera. And this became, uh, well, for us, extremely helpful because it was something we were already doing. The second um, indicator is creating or curating relevant content for our students. When we say curating, we mean choosing intentionally the content that we want to flip when we're not creating it, right? Like finding it in different uh, resources. And the third one is um, making, uh, differentiating the content and making it accessible to all students. So we'll be sharing as well, you know, very specific strategies and, and activities that we use to differentiate. Okay, so let us start with the first indicator, which is I prioritize concepts using direct instruction for learners to access on their own. Uh, if we think about language teaching, uh, we can be thinking about a textbook, right? And so before the pandemic or many years ago, um, institutions would just tell the teacher, you have to teach the 12 units of the book, okay? Regardless if your students have um, are fast learners or not so fast learners, if your students have difficulties understanding, if your students have access to a CD player or any device to play the audio, it was just you have to cover the 12 units of the book, right? And so coverage was everything. But when we flip, we have to prioritize concepts. We have to think about what students really need and make sure we cater for that. We uh, provide what they need and we teach students. We don't teach content, right? So thinking about this, um, we can think of backward design, which is a way to plan our classes. So I, I like this sentence from Stephen Covey in his book, uh, The Habits of, Effect of Highly Effective People. And it says, to begin with the end in mind means to start with a clear understanding of your destination. It means to know where you are going so that you better understand where you are now so that the steps you take are always in the right direction. So uh, if we see the next slide, it's like a saying that my grandmother uh, used to repeat constantly. If you don't know where you're going, any bus will do. You know, So if you have no idea where you want to be or where you want your students to be, any route is going to be good enough, right? However, if we think about backward design, we're thinking about intentionality because we revert the planning process. We revert the order of the regular steps that we use for planning. So let's take a look at um, Wiggins, wait, I forgot the name. Wiggins and Magdai, um, their process is called backward design. It's within the book called Understanding by Design. And this is a wonderful resource if you want uh, to go deeper on this uh, topic. So the first point, as you see, this starts from, okay, in my case, from right to left, I guess in your case, from left to right, I don't know how this is showing, but as you can see, it's backwards, right? So we start with identifying the desired results. So we start with the objectives. What is it that I want my students to do? What is it that I want them to achieve by the end of this term, of this unit, of this module, of this whatever? So this is something we thought about uh, during the pandemic, right? It was like, oh my God, I need my students to blah, but I just have this very limited amount of time with them. And I have this platform and I have the, their parents at home and I have, so we started to think 
how can I play all these elements, all these moving parts into a lesson that can take my students to that goal? So that's backward design. So then we think about the acceptable evidence. Now, because we had the supervision of parents and parents wanted to know, you know how to help their students and also, for example, our university students, they also wanted to know how they were doing. So we started being more intentional about creating rubrics and about checklists and about different means to assess that learning that they were doing or also to keep track of the steps that they needed to follow in order to achieve those goals. So that's the determination of acceptable evidence. Then, and only then, when we have thought of the goals, where we want students to go and how we're going to assess them, only then we think about the activities, right? Only then we think about the learning experiences and instruction. So our decision-making process kind of shifted a little bit, but this is something that is not new. As you can see from the reference, Wiggins and McTighe thought of this in 1998. So this is something that has been around for many years. Just we have started to see it in, in, you know, in action. And this helps us prioritize concepts because with this in mind, we know that we cannot achieve a thousand goals in a term, but we have to be very focused and specific and have priorities in our planning. Okay, so within, um, within Wiggins and Matai's model, uh, there is he has like a concentric, they have a concentric circle type of model where uh, we establish curricular priorities, right? So we need to think about the enduring understanding. So what is that? What is that knowledge that students need to take with them at the end of their life at school with us? So is it really the verbs? Is it really the adverbs or are the so-called soft skills? Um, are the so-called... Uh, 21st century skills, you know, 21 years into the 21st century, and we're still talking about this as if, as if it is innovation. Um, anyway, enduring understanding is pretty much that. What do we really need students to know? And then we move on to the important to know and to do, right? So what do I need my students to practice, to master, to get their hands on? And then what is worth being familiar with? Yeah, so that's kind of the last uh, part of the circle. We think of that at the end. So we don't start thinking, oh, we need students to know every single adverb finishing in Lee. <laughs> yeah, we just need them to understand that there are certain things. Yeah, so this is this image, this graph helps us make decisions. Okay, can we? There we go. And I like to call this the party in heaven, right? Why? Because uh, finally, I guess, Benjamin Bloom, Jerome Bruner, and Lev Vygotsky are holding hands in heaven saying, finally, these people are doing what we have been preaching for years. Um, as you can see in the years, 1956, 1966, 1978, it's no new information. But Benjamin Bloom thought about mastery learning. He thought about students cannot move from one topic to the next until they're ready. But we keep on covering, you know, coverage, just putting units through their eyes. No, if students are not ready to handle things, you know, we shouldn't move them forward. So if we put students at the center of the learning process and we hear them more, then we are going to be able to provide these experiences where they master learning. Also, Jerome Bruner talked about learning scaffolds. Students are not going to get there, you know, to write a literature review just because you tell them to, you know, they need scaffolds, they need the little steps one by one to get there. And we can provide those, yeah, as teachers, we can provide them. And then, well, let me got to with his social constructivism. Yes, students learn better when they are with others. Students learn better when they engage with people in their own age. So if we have only a Zoom platform or a WhatsApp group, how can we create this engagement? How can we put them to work together? And how can we make them create socially so that they benefit from this and they are the ones in the center of the learning process, okay? Okay, so, um, well, there was definitely a lot of decision-making um during the pandemic right with this intentional with this intentional focus on content and 
something we asked ourselves throughout this process, even though we have been flipping for a good amount of time was, okay, like now that we're in pandemic, you know, what do I need to flip or what I need to continue flipping? Um, is there any content that I'm not going to flip? And, you know, basically how can this lead students to work independently in the different tasks that we are uh, proposing for them or the different content? And the big question that you see right there in the middle is, you know, what is the best use of me in the synchronous space? So because we had already been flipping, uh, as Carolina mentioned, right, we were kind of like, the flipping helped us in the pandemic because we already had a lot of content. The big question was, okay, now that that we're in the in a synchronous space, how do we shift what we used to do in the face to face um, setting into this synchronous online space? So we're going to share a couple of examples um, of you know what we're doing. I guess some currently, some from the past, some connecting nowadays and uh, this is an example of, of like me flipping I'm, I'm actually right now teaching a course a methods course at UPTC and I just chose one example so I'm flipping um, con content about growth mindset and thinking about that backward design right uh, the task is always in mind so it's 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 what do I want students to be able to do by the end of this unit let's say right and what is that criteria that Carolina was, was mentioning, you know, like thinking of the rubrics, or in my case, I use checklists. And what are the steps to get my students there? Of course, um, even though uh, in my case, I've been flipping for many years, there's content that I, that I intentionally do not flip. Um, and many, in many cases, these, uh, it's, content that has to do maybe like with emotional, uh, you know, like emotional information or just information that I consider could be a, a, like intertwined with different types of tasks directly with students. The key here is combining them with active learning. So it's not about, you know, me being at the center talking, but we're going to do different tasks while I am talking about something, but you're, you as students are involved throughout the full process of one lesson. What about you, Carol? Well, in my case, with that research methods course, uh, well, I created some, some lessons, some videos about uh, the different parts of the research. Well, I have I've created, no, I cannot use the past tense. I'm still creating because uh, this there's just so much to do, right? So much to create. Uh, but for example, this, those things, what is the literature review? How do you fill out a matrix? What kind of information do you need to collect from each one of the articles in order to uh, have a complete matrix that later will help you build your literature review document, right? But what I haven't uh, flipped in this, in this regard or in this unit is um, the questions, the conversations with students. Of course, in the Zoom room, uh, for example, as you can see, maybe too little, but um, there is a question there in a Mentimeter where it says, please write the difficulties you have had with the literature review and the theoretical framework up to now. So here I have each one of my students uh, talking about the difficulties that they have experienced in differentiating these two sections of the document or in uh, reading the different kinds of, um, of resources that they get for each one of them or understanding how to extract information from either one of them. So those conversations are necessary. That's what they need me for. You know, they need me to help them clarify those things. Okay, so now we're going to go into the second um, indicator of the, of the pillar of intentional content, which is cur curation or creation, right? So I create or curate relevant content for my students. So this is a big question uh, because some people say that you need to create your own materials and other people say you shouldn't or you don't have the time. So I, I like this quote by Highfield, Hilton and Landis. They are the creators of the HyperDoc handbook. And they say teacher, teachers are designers, 
not assigners. Yes, I understand Khan Academy is flooded with videos about different topics and YouTube is full of things, but you know your students better than anyone else, right? So you know their needs, you know what they like, you know what they, um, that their contextual information. So this today more than ever is easy to do. Before we had to adjust to a textbook, you know, that was created for people in India or in other countries. And we never had references to our own countries, to our own reality, to our own scenarios. Now with the internet, we have all that, all those possibilities open for us. So, um, girl, there we go. And John Bergman, he tells us we should create our own content. He's one of the pioneers of flipped learning. So he suggests us to create this content that is actually uh, situated for our students, you know, that we know them, we know what they need, and we can cater for them. Of course, you might say, but when? <laughs> so that's the, I think that's the next slide, right? <laughs> We have this expectation versus reality idea. Yeah, we should create all of our own materials, but who has the time, right? We don't have the time. We cannot do this every single class, every single uh, course that we have. I know many of you are going to have five, six, seven courses with 30 students or more. Or more. You, you don't have time to do this creation. So we need to uh, plan you know, in the long run, we will be able to create our own materials. So can we tell them, girl, about <laughs> our own creation? So we think that course iterations increase creation, right? So if we teach a course once and then we have to teach another course and then another course, it's more difficult. But if we teach the same course many times, every time we teach it, we'll have more and more resources, right? So if you ask me, um, I will tell you that I have between 50 and 80% of created content um, and the same between 50 and 20% of curated content. It depends on the type of course that I teach and it depends on the, on the times that I have taught it. Yeah, so for example, when I was teaching my English course, I taught that course for like seven times. So every semester I would add something, I would change something, you know, it would be different every semester, but I would be able to add more. Um, now, this is the second time that I have that research course, and so I have new resources. I've been able to put together things uh, this semester that I started creating last semester, and so on. What about the story for you, Martha? What is it? Yeah, I think, I think the key here is um, to understand that when we're teaching courses for the first time, they're never going to be. <laughs> I mean, there will always be errors. There will always be a lack of time to, you know, have everything uh, as ready as we would like it to be. Um, and so it's just, you know, with that mindful uh, idea of understanding, you know, this is the first time it's, it's tough. I'm getting to know the course. I'm getting to know the, con the content, et cetera. Then the following times will always bring uh, new, new, new types of content. I think Carolina and I have rethought you know even though we've we've been teaching some courses for you know some years from one semester to another sometimes something just completely changed like a new course sometimes the content uh works very well and then we just tweak it so i think that's the key yeah so here's an example uh of that uh iteration creation uh favor so a little bit of a couple of slides ago, we showed you my video about the literature review, right? Now, this semester, that video is embedded within a lesson because I had all the resources, I had put together the matrix, I had put together a video on how to read academic articles, and, and I already had done all of those things like isolatedly for last semester. I would send them to my students via WhatsApp or upload them into the Google Classroom, but this semester I was able to put them all together into a literature review lesson on genially very nice and well planned, right? But it took me two semesters <laughs> to get to this. So don't worry, it doesn't mean that you need to go now and only plan content and create content all the time. No, you take your time. You take your time and it's the same as you are doing now. Probably you are preparing PowerPoint presentations, probably you are preparing handouts on Word. 
it's basically that, but thinking, I mean, expanding your decision making as to inserting interactivity, inserting student uh, feedback, inserting communication among students within your products. So uh, that, that content is not static, but actually it is interactive and dynamic and it helps you um, in creating deeper learning experiences. So um, um, we're gonna share which are the tools that we prefer for planning. So um, in my case, uh, it's kind of simple. <laughs> it's Google Slides, it's Prezi, Prezi Video. It has a new feature, it's cool. Uh, Perusal, because I teach uh, you know, the reading classes this semester, I haven't been able to use that very much. And Screencast-O-Matic, and as I mentioned, I'm moving towards Marta's side with Geniali, because I'm, I'm actually exploring that one a lot more. Marta? Yeah, so these are these are my top. I well, you t today we're presenting through Genially. So Genially is one of my top tools, um, and I like to design content through Canva. And for reading, just kind of to make the comparison with what Caro uses and what I use, I use Actively Learn. Uh, but there are different tools, of course, to flip reading uh, or to flip other types of content. So we're going to share with you um, just some examples. And uh, so the first one in my case, um, something I've started to do, I started to do during the pandemic was creating digital paths. So students, uh, this is in Spanish, but it's, you know, students have to click in the door, the door opens a, a, a room, then they have to click, like find the different uh, standards, right? And then answer some questions to be able to unlock the door and, you know, leave. Um, so that's that's one of the one of the one of my new um, types of intentional content that I've been applying uh, since the pandemic. Another one is uh, was shifting from physical games. I used to take like board games or you know the, the printed board game uh, cards, etc., to the classroom, and then you know digitally it it was okay. Like what can I use? to convert this game into a game that students can play online. Um, so these examples all use um, Genially. However, there are other websites where you can you know, create your own games, but these have been uh, created from scratch um, that I used to have in some cases physically, and then I put them into the digital format. Uh, I started taking a course on sketchnoting a year ago and yeah, a year ago already. And um, so I used to, I, actually in my blog post, I have a reflection on how to use sketch notes as an active learning strategy, which was very intentional pre-pandemic. And then um, I kind of shifted into how can I design sketch notes to flip content? So here are a couple of examples, like from you know, my methods classes or uh, my didactics classes and from my English classes. And one last, one last example is um, gamification, like starting to gamify and designing challenges. Uh, so some of my students uh, right now are doing what we've called the Twitter challenge. Again, with Genially, they have to click on each of the birds. The birds have uh, a challenge and I've flipped the explanation of how they need to use Twitter uh, in the little button of instructions, which you see over here. And then, you know, they'll find the content in a guide and a video and um, accountability is super important. So there's a format where they have to post the evidence so that I know that they've completed the challenge. And you, Caro? Yeah, well, Marta's materials are so impressive I, I i am getting there you know i'm trying to uh of course uh, when you are with someone uh, something ends up rubbing up on you and so i've learned a lot from martha's way to think um uh, in design ideas i use genially which is pretty easy to use and for example in my case this uh data collection methods and instruments and overview this is another digital path here, students have to follow the, the different steps and just go step by step, you know, in getting uh, access to some materials, reading, um, understanding the topic and creating some tasks. 
uh, but also, you know, this helps and it helps them pace their own learning because uh, each student, even though they have deadlines for the different steps, they decide when and how to access this material. Also, I guess the next one, it's my baby, HyperDocs. I, I kind of learned about HyperDocs, uh, I don't know, back in 2017. And um, ever since I've been working on it, this is a digital lesson that has seven steps according to the creators of this methodology. And um, I've been using it for different classes, for different courses, and it's great. Um, as I mentioned, it's a digital lesson. So I had been planning these lessons before the pandemic. So imagine how helpful they were during the pandemic. Um, they were already digitized and everything. So that was, that was easy. So I want to show you how a HyperDoc um, kind of flows. So there are seven steps according to the creators. Engage is the first one. Um, here, mindfulness exercise. Uh, then the explore is the second. I'm exploring present tenses with the character survey offered by VIA, where students get their signature character strengths. And we talk about character strengths in class using this, the present tenses. Here, I have students take notes on some videos that I harvested from the internet, do some practice exercises. As you can see, there are application exercises within the HyperDoc. Um, also, then there is um, a more open practice, sorry, not not guided, but free practice. So here it's a Google form, students fill it out. Then we share, we share products. We use, for example, Flipgrid. In this case, students were supposed to record um, a one minute video about their profile in the character strengths survey. Then we assess the videos, you know. So as you can see in the HyperDoc, we can include everything. And as you can see, it's a simple combination of Google tools. Um, so Google Docs, Google Slides, um, Flipgrid in this case, I added a Padlet for the reflection portion of the HyperDoc. So here are all the comments of my students reflecting on how great uh, they, they thought the HyperDocs were and how they liked some of the materials that were there. So you might ask, oh my God, but that takes a long time to, to create. Yes, it does. It does. It takes some time to create, but it's worth the investment because students just are all working um, at their own pace, right? So extend is the last part of the hyperdoc. This is an entirely different presentation that I could uh, give you uh, because it's a very rich topic and it really helps uh, in enhancing content and also having students um, interact with the content and with each other within the digital lesson. Also, as I mentioned, uh, Prezi Video, it's, it's a new feature of Prezi. It just makes videos nicer. Uh, so I like to use that one as well. I'm creating lessons with that and it, it really helps students. And for also because I like to have my students discuss readings um, synchronously or asynchronously, this website can help you. The thing, of course, is that it has uh, copyright for the bibliographic material that you use. So you would have to purchase material. However, you can use your own PowerPoints. You can use your own PDFs that once you create, you can put them there and students can discuss those uh, materials with you. So the thing is, as you can see in our examples, it's just many different ways to offer content and to curate or create depending on you know, what you want to do with your class. So let's move on to uh, the third indicator of the pillar. Okay, so um, this third indicator is differentiating content, how we make decisions to differentiate so students, so all students can have access to this content. So we're going to do it like a very brief uh, explanation. We know our time is running out. Um, so when we talk about differentiation, I think the first person who comes to our mind is Carol Tomlinson. And what she tells us is that we can differentiate uh, the content, right? We can differentiate the process. We can differentiate the product. And, uh, oops, sorry for that typo, affecto, uh, the affect. <laughs> um, and these taken into account, learning profile, student readiness, and interest. So this is something that we've considered in the types of content that we 
that we differentiate and that we'll show you in just a few seconds, <laughs> uh, the examples. Yeah, and um, on top of differentiation or to materialize differentiation, we have been using universal design for learning um, because it just uh, speaks directly to flipped learning. They are languages that just, you know, overlap. In universal design for learning, we, are, uh, we need to provide different forms of engagement. We provide different means of representation. Uh, girl, can you move the, the slide, please? There we go. So we provide multiple means of engagement, the why, multiple means of representation, and multiple means of express, action and expression. So this means that we should provide students, um, all students in our class, right? Different uh, ways to engage with the content, to represent their learning, and to act and express on what they learn. But you might think, oh my God, Carolina, so are you telling me that I need to plan 50 different lessons because I have 50 different students? No, you don't. You just need to know your students' variability. What is the student variability that you have in your class? What are the kinds of activities they like? You can earn uh, all this knowledge by conducting a diagnosis at the, at the beginning of your class and its analysis uh, or an its assessment that can help you really understand your learners. And then you can provide options for recruiting interest, sustaining effort, self-regulation, etc. Right, so there are some questions you can ask yourselves when planning uh, grow. We're gonna go to the next slide. So all this information is taken from CAST um, and they have all these checklists available for you if you want to explore. So you can think about how learners will engage with the lesson and ask yourself these questions on the right. Then think about how information is presented to learners and then think about how learners are expected to act strategically and express themselves. So by the materials that we are going to show you, uh, we have tried to provide all these multiple means uh, for students, for all students to feel included and to feel a part of our lesson. We are going to, uh, with this, with Universal Design for Learning, as Dario pointed out, we are honoring student diversity. We are uh, responding to students' needs without having to plan one individual lesson for everybody. So examples, let's take a look. Okay, um, so I think one of my uh, like biggest aha moments during pandemic was starting to flip instructions. Um, I was flipping, you know, just everything, you know, content and explanations, et cetera. And because students were disconnecting or they had issues or, you know, all these issues we've had, um, just with synchronous classes, I started to literally design the instructions with the roles, with the task, et cetera. And after reading Bondi and uh, Zhu Shou's work on differentiated instruction, then I just uh, implemented what they, what they mentioned regarding having very clear instructions with roles, with tasks, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I, I do have a blog post about this if anybody wants to kind of see the step-by-step. Also, uh, providing choice. So remember those paths <laughs> I mentioned uh, previously. Uh, some uh, I've started thinking of, you know, paths where students can actually decide on uh, here. The topic was perspective and stance. So they open a specific door. There's a specific uh, perspective. Then they choose an issue uh, from that perspective, you know, go into a drawer. The cat tell them, tells them what they have to do, et cetera. Um, so this has been very uh, successful with students. They, they like having that possibility uh, of choice. Also choice through choice boards or um, learning menus. So here's just two examples. One to teach cause and effect divided in process, uh, the content, the process and the product, which you see like purple, pink and blue. And um, recently I created an active learning menu to flip how to teach about active learning through a differentiated uh, strategy, which is this one of the menu. And you, Caro? Well, that's another example of a choice board. Um, I use Word, you know, just simple Google Docs and create 
the board there with the, with the links. The idea anyway is to have, as Marta says, to provide students with voice and choice uh, in their learning so that they can take the route that they want uh, towards learning a concept or practicing. In this case, this is a practicing choice board. There is another example there that is Marta's famous hybrid in class flip. <laughs> um, so, okay, so regarding differentiation, uh, well, this is this is our reality now, right? We're all, well, not, not all of us, but many of us are teaching classes, uh, at, you know, have to go to the campus and then we have students who are online, students who are living in, in different uh, cities who haven't been able to come back. Um, so I designed an in-class flip, uh, which was basically using station work, in this case, uh, a station work in-class flip. And I designed my, the same classroom setting, I made it digital. So students who were connected through the Zoom had to click. And, you know, they had the different steps of the stations, the ones who were with me, with the, which you can see in the photo, um, had to walk around the classroom with QR codes um, and just, you, you know, use their devices to be able to do the exact same work that students were doing online. And my last example is about um, the project, the research project. So I created the thesis writing guide, which is a document um, that I created based on the work of Dr. Astrid Nunez, who is going to present in the afternoon today. Um, and then I, I made it a very simple chart, a very simple Word document. But then I thought, well, what about my techie students? So the ones who really enjoy technology. So I created a Trello board um, that has the Kanban board methodology for to do, doing, and done for the research project. So students can move the little cards around, you know, to feel uh, positive feedback loops with their project. So these are two different, um, two different ways to represent the same material, just because there are some students who prefer more techie stuff, who have an app on their phone, who can do it, and others who prefer the Word document. And this I did, of course, in two separate moments of time, um, because choice needs to be provided, but because also I need, to regulate my own time. So um, we are just showing you how we can differentiate content by providing either option through choice boards and learning menus, or uh, for example, choice by different types of product, by also offering different means of representation for students, you know, to show them how they can actually learn or consume the content. So the idea is just listen to your students and, and see what they like and, you know, start navigating uh, the creation of material with that in mind. So uh, something important for me as, as a teacher educator is that, um, well, I hope to be a model for students. And as students, as sorry, as the Esma Gioli says, Teachers or teachers can provide modeling by demonstrating teacher procedures, showing their thinking in action by verbalizing decisions they make, and also by exhibiting their professionalism. So as, as part of the teacher education program, uh, it's my hope that students see all my practices as something they can take to their classrooms in the future. And today, the idea for us to share with you what we do in our classrooms is precisely that is to share with you ways that you can enhance your teaching and ways you can move that content forward so that it actually becomes more intentional for all of your learners. I think here, just to complement this quote, there's a quote that I use and it's like, teach what you preach. Like we preach as, as teacher educators, we preach a lot about, you know, what works, what the theory says, what the experts tell us. And, you know, if we're not, being a model, we're not really showing, you know, this is what I want you to do. And I'm showing you how to do it uh, in your role as students. Well, you know, then we're not, we're not teaching what we preach. Okay, so, um, well, I think we, uh, we have maybe, maybe a, some, or I don't know, one minute, a couple of minutes for questions or some comments. Uh, from the audience. Thank you very much for listening to us and for connecting to this wonderful event. Thank you very much, uh, Professors uh, Buitrago and Ramirez, for giving us the opportunity um, to learn from your experience. I've, I found it very interesting 
like the opportunities and challenges that you have faced, especially because you have been working on flip learning for quite a long time. And still there are many issues to wonder about and to reflect upon. Thank you very much. Um, just uh, because of time, I think I'm going to read some comments and I invite you maybe to answer a couple of questions that we have in the chat. But um, so I'm going to read the comments. So we have a comment from Patricia Kim. And she, Professor Patricia Kim says, uh, excellent presentation. Professor Arisa says, very interesting approach. Uh, Professor Vanega says, I have learned so much from this presentation. Thank you, Marta and Carolina. Uh, uh, Andrea Galindo, thank you very much. Great talk about flip content. I have enjoyed and learned a lot from your work. Carmen Herrera, thank you, Professors Marta and Carolina, for sharing this approach. I am interested in learning more and implement it in my classroom. Uh, Jonathan Vasquez says, thank you. Uh, it has been an honor to count on your expertise. And um, as I told you, we invite you to take a look, uh, maybe if you have some extra time, to take a look at the questions that we have on the chat that are basically a, about like very, um, I would say some of the practical insights of um, what you were talking about. Thank you very much. I think this is our time for today. And um, we hope you continue having a great day. Thank you very much for joining us and thank you very much for the audience. Now uh, we continue with our next uh, moderator and our next uh, presenter. So Annie, you are very welcome. Thank you, Professor Berta. Good morning, dear Professor Jamit Jose Fandino Parra, and good morning, dear audience. It is a great honor to present you, Professor Jamit Fandino, for uh, to our 21st Teachers Mood event. Professor Fandino is visiting us from La Universidad de La Salle, and he's going to present us his research study, taking the decolonial tour. Resisting and Transgressing Coloniality in ELT. And it is my greatest honor again to present Professor Fandino. Uh, Professor uh, Yami Fandino Parra has a bachelor's degree in philology in English from the Universidad Nacional de Colombia. He is a specialist in virtual learning environment from Virtual Educa Argentina. He also holds a master's in teaching from La Universidad de La Salle. And he's currently studying uh, the doctor program, um, uh, the doctor program, Doctorado en Educación y Sociedad from the Universidad de La Salle. He has been an English as a foreign language teacher from, June, from young students and adults and at different universities and institutions. Currently, he works as a full time teacher researcher at La Universidad de La Salle in Bogota, Colombia. Uh, I am going to ask a favor, a favor to all of the audience today, please, to write all of your comments and questions in the chat. We will be reading then, and after Professor Fandino's presentation, he will be uh, um, answering the questions. So without any further introduction, thank you so much, Professor Fandino, for being with us today. The floor is yours. Well, first of all, thank you so much for this wonderful invitation. I really appreciate this opportunity, first of all, to get to listen to what my colleagues in the world are doing, um, about exclusion, about flipped learning, and the other um, uh, guests, speakers that you guys have. I'm going to have a great opportunity of learning. That is something so important, to learn from others. And also, it's a nice opportunity to um, share what I'm doing here in Bogota at La Salle University. So I'm going to start sharing my screen and the presentation. Give me one second, please. Okay. All right. I'm going to enhance this. All right. So first of all, I wanna I, I wanna tell you that this is part of what I have been doing in my PhD studies at Universidad de La Salle. And what I'm gonna do today is to share with you some general ideas that I hope can help us 
understand the importance of resisting and transgressing coloniality in English language teaching. And the invitation for us to resist and to transgress is to take the decolonial turn. Well, the agenda, uh, I'm gonna have a little introduction where I'm going to tell you about how I came about this concept and why I'm, I'm talking about it. Then I will try very quickly and briefly to talk about the, the colonial theory of life and history. And I will then move into the colonial history of English language teaching. I will suggest uh, a couple of strategies for liberatory practices in ELT. And I will also comment on some uh, studies carried out in Colombia, studies proposing the colonial pedagogies. Okay, so let me start by sharing these analysis that I made when I was starting my studies at Universidad de La Salle. I realized that I was right in the middle of two centuries. I started learning to be an English teacher in the 90s at Universidad Nacional. And I became a teacher educator in the 21st century. So for me, it was important to realize where I was coming from when I became a, a, an English teacher, an EFL teacher, that was the 20th century in the 90s. And it was, it was also important for me to realize what was happening in the moment I became a teacher educator in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. So as many of you and, uh, and some of you attending, you have probably read, studied, discussed different issues connected to language, learning, pedagogy, research. But interestingly enough, we still use authors, proposals, perspectives from the 20th century. And there's nothing wrong with that. Don't get, don't get me wrong. But we also need to acknowledge what's new. What are the new possibilities, the alternatives? So many of us are used to talking about the extractural model, the functional model, the interactional model, the social cultural model when we think about language. But we don't really talk about bilingualism, biliteracy, biculturalism, or at least not as much as we could. We have heard and we, maybe we have explored concepts such as inter, multi, pluri, and transculturalism, but maybe we are not still very clear about authors, about possibilities, etc. Literacies and multimodality is something that maybe we have heard, maybe we have read a couple of times, but again, it's something that we haven't explored much. Now, thinking about language, three concepts don't appear as much as, we, as they should in relation to what language is. And they are power, dominance, and inequality. Let me give you another example in terms of learning. Many of us, have read, discussed, reflected about behaviorism, cognitivism, humanism, contractivism, cognitivism. And maybe we have had the opportunity of listening, reading, and maybe thinking about multiple intelligences, emotional intelligence, autonomy and learner-centeredness. Yes, probably not so much with situated learning and community-based learning, we have heard about the 21st century skills and we might have come across subjectivity, intersubjectivity and identity. But again, what I'm trying to say is, as you notice, we have, uh, we still use lots of authors, lots of proposals from the 20th century. We based our decisions, our practices, our discourses on those ideas, on those authors, which is okay. But the question that I wanna, that, that I was asking myself when I was doing this reflection was, okay, but what is what are the topics? What are the ideas? What are the issues that I need to be more aware of in the 21st century as a teacher educator? Another aspect that I reflected upon was pedagogy. And I noticed that in the 20th century, I was used to thinking about teacher-based versus learner-based pedagogy or product-oriented versus process-oriented pedagogy or technical, 
practical emancipatory pedagogy. And I was also used to thinking, reading, discussing about method-centered pedagogy versus context-centered pedagogy. But when I was, uh, when I became a teacher educator 10 years ago, 12 years ago, I started noticing new issues, new topics, such as post-method pedagogy, transformative pedagogy, multiliteracies, decolonial pedagogy, and pedagogies of the South. Something similar happened when I reflected about research. So I was used to thinking about research in terms of positivism, interpretativism, sociocriticism, quantitative, qualitative, and mixed research. But when I uh, started exploring issues, topics related to research in the 21st century, I realized that there were some issues that I had read, but I had somehow approached, such as post-structuralism, deconstruction, genealogy, performativity. I was not very aware, for, for example, in my own case, about horizontal research, decolonial research, critical reflexivity, transformative praxis, collective ownership, etc. So this is an example of something that I did. And I realized that I became a language teacher in the 20th century, that I had acquired, legitimized, and naturalized discourses about language, learning, pedagogy, and research. They were taught to me. I learned them. And with other colleagues, we talk about them. We mobilize different ideas that we learned, that we acquired, that we incorporated into our teaching repertoire, into our teacher cognition. However, I also noticed that when I was thinking about the 21st century as a teacher educator, there were some issues, some perspectives that I was not very familiar with. I mean, I have seen them around. I have participated in a couple of activities, congresses, symposia, et cetera, where some of these issues were approached, but I was not very aware of them. I was not informed. And more than that, they were not really impacting my practices. They were not transforming my discourses, particularly for that you can, uh, that I wanted to pay attention to. In terms of language, power, dominance, and inequality. In terms of learning, inner subjectivity and identity. In terms of pedagogy, the colonial pedagogy and pedagogies of the South. And in terms of research, the colonial research, critical reflexivity, transformative praxis, collective ownership. So what, what I realized is that I needed to make, to turn the page, that it was important for me, number one, to realize that we were not in the 21st century anymore. <laughs> I mean, epistemologically and methodologically speaking, and that we were facing a new century, a new century with new issues, new challenges, new perspectives in terms of language, learning, pedagogy, and research. And the issues or the topics, the perspectives that resonated with me as a teacher educator are the ones that you can see highlighted or within these um, forms that I decided to use. I was interested in the connection between language and power and inequality. And I was also interested in exploring learning, but learning from such activity, particularly identity. And I was also mm, cu curious, and I was also mm, interested in the colonial pedagogy and pedagogies of, of the South. And I was also wondering about what the colonial research was about. So this is just an example of an, an invitation that I'm trying to make this morning. I understand as language teachers, we were raised, we are the product of a particular moment, of a particular place. And obviously that we appreciate that. We, we became teachers or we have, we are in the process of becoming teachers as a result of the schools where we, where we studied, of the teachers that we had, of the professors that we um, had the opportunity of interacting with, of the universities, of the institutions where we started learning what language, learning, pedagogy, and research were all about. 
But it's also important to notice that as human beings, we are facing a constant change. And the question that we should ask, what needs to change in terms of language, in terms of learning, in terms of pedagogy, and in terms of research now, in today, for the 21st century? So in brief, this is just an example of what I did when I decided to do or to pursue my PhD studies. What I wanted to do was to really transform myself, to transform myself epistemologically, ontologically, and methodologically speaking. I wanted to do things with new ideas, with new perspectives. So what I'm gonna show you is result of that process, what I'm, what I'm about to share with you. But first, I wanna, sh I wanna share with you a small segment from a video. We're living an age of change, but what change? What needs to be changed? Who needs to change? So I, I will share with you, I'm, I'm going to, uh, to do that in one second. I will share with you one minute or two minutes maximum of this video by Alaya Hazina. She's going to talk to us about biased histories, dehumanizing practices, and perpetuary lies. And that is the kind of change that I'm talking about. What biased histories were we taught and are we still continuing reproducing? What dehumanizing practices did we learn to live with? And what dehumanizing practices we need to eliminate from our societies? What perpetuated lies one way or another, we learn to accept, to legitimize, to naturalize, and what lies we need to stop believing and we need to uh, shed some light on. So let me, give me one second, I'm going to change, to stop sharing my presentation so I can share with you um, my, the video. One second, please. Okay. I think I'm sharing it. No estamos viendo. Okay, so thank you. I will stop sharing. Give me one second. And I will share the, okay, here it is. Okay. So, we're gonna share, uh, I'm gonna share with you one minute probably. L let me just make sure that I'm sharing the, the, this video with sound, no? Because sometimes, yes, perfect. Let's listen to the first minute, may maybe two minutes. At the age of eight, my dad brought me in history encyclopedia. I loved it. I read it all the time. And I still have it now. But in it, there's no front cover anymore. There's no back cover. There's not even really a spine. It's just a dusty book on my bookshelf. But when I was reading it, I realized there were a couple things missing. So this is me reading it realizing there are a couple things missing. And then I'd go to my history classes and realize that there are a couple more things missing. And I started to think, surely history can't just be castles and white men in tights. Like there has to be more to history than that. It can't just be that low. Like, my ancestors must have come from somewhere. Why aren't they in my encyclopedia? And so one of the stories that was missed was of a Brummy boy called Francis, called Samuel Galton. We'll get to Francis a little bit later. But Samuel Galton was a gun maker. He made guns in Birmingham's gun quarter and he sold them all across the world. He sold them in exchange for black women's bodies on the west coast of Africa. He sold broken and faulty guns for black women who would be sold into slavery in the Caribbean and the Americas. 
And it started to get me thinking that through colonization, through the white men in tights that were in my book, traveling all across the world thinking they knew what was best, the price of a black woman's body was equivalent to a faulty gun, to a broken gun. That was the value of a black woman's life. And so we skip forward a little bit to the 19th century. Okay. So this video that I'm sharing with you, that I was sharing with you is part of an example of histories, stories that are hidden, that are not explicit, that we don't pay attention to because there is some level of truth that we are supposed to know, that we're supposed to learn. That is the one thing that we need to acquire, that we need to develop. And other possibilities, other alternatives, other options are not present, are not even discussed, as the example we were watching in the video about this, this situation of a person uh, selling faulty guns to get black women's bodies to be sold. In the video, she continues giving examples of all of those stories. But let's go back to our presentation and how this connects to the decolonial turn. So let me share once again my uh, presentation. Okay, and I'm going to... So definitely, we should all, as teachers, as members of the ELT community, we should ask ourselves, what are the bias histories that one way or another we acquired, we naturalized, and one way or another we are perpetuating, we are imposing over others? What dehumanizing practices or what perpetuary lies take place when we go into a classroom? or when we are members of, in, uh, of schools, universities. So I realized that it was important for me as a teacher educator, as a teacher, as a language teacher, a person in charge of helping others learn to communicate, learn to express themselves, learn to construct knowledge, that I, it was important for me to know and to get information about the decolonial theory of life and history. And I found a very interesting author whose last name I always have a hard time pronouncing. He's from Africa. And what he proposes, Lovo Gansheni, if I'm not wrong, from the year 2016, what he says is so powerful or impacted me in so many ways that that's why I wanna share his perspective with you. And it's the importance of a theory of life and how that theory of life has been impacted by the colonial theory, colonial theory or colonial practices better. So what is a theory of life? He says that is this uh, need to decolonize being, decolonize, knowledge, decolonize power, because there are ways in which they have been imbricated in denial of life to those who were pushed into the zone of not being, of not existing, of not being part of history. So there, what he says basically is in terms of being, there's a lot of racial profiling, a lot of classification, a lot of hierarchization in terms of knowledge, there is a lot of epistemocytes and appropriation of other knowledges. And the idea that the European and the North American knowledge is the only one that matters. And in terms of power, he will also always uh, also say that there is usurpation and that there is loss of hellenocentrism, he, eurocentrism, and westernization. Now, this is an interesting perspective because what he says or what he tries to make us realize is what we have learned, what we have been told and what we are doing belongs to a particular way of understanding history, of understanding life, of understanding language, learning, pedagogy, research. 
And the question that we need to ask ourselves is, what is not being told? What are the other possibilities? Okay, but let's move on. Let's continue thinking about these, the colonial theory of life and history. He will try to tell us that as a result of the heliocentrism, the westernization and the Eurocentrism, well, as you might remember, this idea, the first concept, heliocentrism, is connected to the, concept, uh, the conception of human history starting with Athens, with Greece. And then the idea of westernization, what he's trying to tell us is that there was, again, human history connected to the, Ameri the American and the Euro-North centric values, histories, processes, etc. And Eurocentrism, that is the, what we have nowadays, this idea of the superiority of Europeans over non-Europeans. As a result of these three historical moments, what we have nowadays, it's colonialism and imperialism. Colonialism understood as the domination of one country over other countries or, or people from other countries through aggressive actions. And imperialism, again, a country's political and economical control over other countries and other people. Now, what do we have as a result of the previous situations, colonialism, imperialism, heliocentrism, westernization, and Eurocentrism? We have some practices and some discourses that we have acquired in schools, in universities, in our societies, with our parents, with our friends, that they appear natural, legitimate, true to us. Ideas such as domination and control, subordination and punishment, ideas such as the, the, the importance of being similar, of disappearing difference, that is hemiogeny, and the idea that some classes, some people, some regions, some cities are superior to others or than others, are, are more superior than others. The idea that we live in a world of hierarchies and because there are hierarchies, there is inequality and that's the way it is. The idea that we have centers and peripheries and then centers are much more important than peripheries. Co other concepts such as first class and wealthy countries versus second class and poor countries. All the idea of coercion and exploitation as being normal, legitimate, common in our society, in our culture, in our times. The idea of homogeneity and one dimensionality, thinking about situations in life, in culture, in society, using common values, common discourses, and normally one perspective that is the one that is considered true, positive, necessary. And as a consequence of all of these values, all of these concepts, all of these situations, we have lots of violence and discrimination, classism, racism, sexism, xenophobia. So the result of the European colonialism and the Western imperialism is a world system. That is the one I'm showing you here in this slide. Now, what we need to ask ourselves as EFL teachers is how are these concepts, how are these discourses, how are our, our practices being impacted, influenced, framed within this world system? To finish, we have, as you might remember, we have heard about different moments in history. Renaissance, the idea that God was not the center um, of knowledge. But Renaissance, give, sorry, the, the idea that God was the center of the world, of humanity, of religion, of our experience. And then enlightenment tell, showing us, well, maybe it's not only God, maybe it's man, maybe it's rationality, maybe it's science. Some years later, the idea of, okay, now it's reason. Reason is what helps us. The, our possibilities to think, 
to exercise our logical thinking will give us power and that power will let us win wars. So imperial reason. And Cartesianism basically saying, well, think about you. Think about you. Egocentrism, racism, sexism. It is you who matter. It is you that it's important. So notice how these different mo historical moments are present in what we do nowadays. We have social groups, we have practices, we have discourses in which some of these historical moments resonate. Now, we also have modernity, a modernity centered in Europe and North America, a modernity that imposed discourses and practice connected to slavery, imperialism, capitalism, mercantilism, coloniality, colonialism. And we have some counter moments or some counter discourses that are the decolonial humanism and pluriversalism. They are counter discourses, counter practices, because what decolonial humanism and the decolonial turn um, is trying to, to help us as teachers, as members of our societies, is to understand new possibilities, new options, new alternatives. Alternatives connected to decolonization, de-imperialization, paradigm of peace, a paradigm based on human development, on humanism, a, a paradigm as Ubuntu, this philosophy from Africa that says, I am because you are. And because I am because you are, we live together. We need to live together. And that also gives us the possibility to think about pluriversalism, cohumanist, many worlds in one, ecologies of knowledge, etc. Well, this historical perspective, just to show you of how as teachers, as language teachers, we need to do a similar process. We need to think about a decolonial theory of ELT. And this is what I'm going to do next. Mm, I wanted to share this video with you, but because of time, I'm, no, I'm not going to maybe do it. But the idea here is Ramon Grossfogel, Grossfogel talks about the co colonialized forms of being and knowing in our world. And he invites us to realize that the world system we have nowadays is not the best one, and that there are other options that as human beings, as professionals, as citizens of the world, we need to explore, we need to study. In other words, it's an invitation. It's an invitation to realize that what we have now has been imposed, that there are lies, violence, situations that are impacting what we know, what we do, what we think, and that is our, our responsibility as professionals and as citizens of the world to explore other options, to, to consider other alternatives. Now, I just show you a theory of a colonial theory of life. Now, what I would like to do is to show you that the colonial history of ELT. It is very interesting that ELT starts with GDC Atkins. And why is this person famous, J.D.C. Uh, Atkins? He was a commissioner in India. He was a commissioner of Indian affairs. And he declared that English should be the language um, that Indians should learn. And he believed that English would help Indians eliminate or forget about their barbarous ways. In other words, English was the access for Indians to access civilization. And that idea, that concept, that a foreign language is a possibility to be a citizen of the world, to be civilized, is still present nowadays. In a very interesting um, perspective, other authors, have said, okay, maybe there is a connection between colonialism, English language teaching, and rationalization. Penny Cook, in the year 1998, introduced a very powerful premise. And it was the importance of realizing that ELT perpetuates structures 
of colonial othering, particularly with two concepts, self and other. Self and other are present when we think about Tiesel. Who teaches in Tiesel? Who, and what is supposed to be taught in Tiesel? So when you analyze Tiesel, teaching English, what English? Who teaches English? How, that, how does this person become an English teacher? So there, is a, there are some representations or constructions, colonial constructions, in that teaching of English. But there are other colonial constructions in the soul part, speakers of other languages. Who are those speakers? Why do they need English as a foreign language? Are their needs and interests considered? So Penny Cook has helped us realize a, the, a colonial history of ELT. But also nowadays, we are living um, ELT within the power of publishing houses and European universities. In other words, publishing houses and European universities are perpetuating this idea of a global empire and a capitalist conquest. One way or another, they spread ideologies and, and epistemologies of the imperial West. Also, ELT nowadays is living within what it's called the linguistic and cultural colonialism. And what the linguistic and cultural colonialism does is to delegitimize third world Englishes. We still want to learn and, and, and governments, universities, schools, society in general, still wants people to learn a, very, a particular English, British or North American, but not English spoken in Africa, not English spoken in India, not English is spoken in other countries, in other regions of the world. And also we have a cultural colonialism that still idealizes the native speaker. So still we want, or we, we try to help, help, quotation marks, students, people to speak as if they were native speakers. Because if they sound and they behave as non-native speakers, they are not doing what they're supposed to do. They come to our classes, to become native-like speakers. So notice how those ideas are a part of the colonial history of ELT. Something, something else happens with a global narrative of English. What is that global narrative? Well, the, the global narrative is English is the one language that all of us should speak. It's the language that has supremacy, that has hegemony and hegemony through models. models that we learn and we replicate. And what we are doing using those models, those approaches, those techniques is replicating or better, naturalizing globalization, neoliberalism, linguistic and cultural colonialism, imperialism, capitalist conquest, etc. Okay. So what I have what I have said so far is that I started with a personal reflection as a language teacher and as a teacher educator, I started reading about colonial history of life. And then I started making connections with the colonial history of ELT. Now, to my surprise, I noticed that for some, for some years of my life as a language teacher, and as a teacher educator, I was replicating many, or better, I was naturalizing and legitimizing discourses and practices that had been imposed. I was not aware of that. I was more concerned with, when I was in my undergraduate studies, I was more concerned with learning what authors said about language, learning, pedagogy, and research. And when I started teaching in institutes, schools, universities, I was, more, uh, I was more concerned with, okay, how can I help my students? What new techniques um, that are 
for me to learn and then to go into the classroom and replicate them, implement them. I was so I was concerned with what is the new thing that I'm supposed to know to 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 be considered a professional language teacher. Um, so I took online courses. I participated in workshops. I attended activities in which the idea was for somebody to tell me that there was a specific kind of knowledge, a specific kind of method that I was supposed to know because there were some good things about that knowledge or that, about that method. And I was supposed to take that knowledge and that method into my classroom and to put it into practice, to implement it. And I'm not saying that that's wrong. Of course not, because we were thinking about, okay, what is, what, what is good for our students? What is good for me as a professional? However, behind those decisions, behind those actions, there are discourses and practices that are imposed, that are vertical, that are colonial, that are perpetuating beliefs, values, that we need to open, that we need to make explicit so that we take better and more informed decisions that are not simply connected to, okay, what am I supposed to teach and how am I supposed to teach it? It's, we still have that obsession, what to teach and how to teach it. And that obsession sometimes clouds our judgment, clouds our possibilities for reflection because we are so worried about what am I supposed to teach to children? What am I supposed to teach to teenagers? What am I supposed to teach to adults now in the 21st century or now that we live in the pandemic? And because that is our concern, that is our, 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 yeah, our main objective, then we start thinking about, okay, how to teach? And then we start looking for answers, looking for recipes, looking for techniques, looking for suggestions. There's nothing wrong with that, I, I insist, but probably what, it's, what we should reflect is, but what is behind what discourses, what practices are controlling what I teach and how I teach it and what I want my students to learn and how I want them to learn it. Now, part of my talk was helping you, sharing with you my own, my own journey, my own personal journey with, as you notice, realizing that I was raised and taught in the 20th century with some discourses, some authors, some theories. And then as a teacher educator, I was noticing new issues, new authors, new theories. And how, to, how I was supposed to, in the, right in the middle of the 20th and the 21st century, to learn to interpret, to learn to comprehend, the different possibilities that I had as a language teacher, as an as an, a teacher educator. And then I found the, the colonial history of life. And later I started talk, reading about the colonial history of ELT. Now I'm sharing this with you to invite you to pursue or to try out a similar journey. Because I believe that our job as teachers is not to simply think about what am I supposed to teach and how am I supposed to teach it, which is part of our job, of course. But more than that, it's how are different discourses and practices impacting who I am and what I can know, what I can be, what I can do as a member of the 21st century, as a member of a society that requires from me other possibilities. So what I'm going to share with you next with the last minutes I have is some ideas some strategies that you might find useful for your own journey, for your own exploration. I'm not telling you that these are the definite options, the, the, the final possibilities. They are out there for you to read, for you to reflect. And you might find some interesting, uh, insightful possibilities. Three probably would be the basic strategies for decolonizing ELT starting with you, starting with our communities. The most important probably is that we need to decolonize our minds. We need to decolonize better our minds. That means, one, we need to 
reconceptualize language, learning, pedagogy, and research. And we need to notice that there are certain values, beliefs, principles that are impacting the way we consider or the way we think about language, learning, pedagogy, and research, particularly concepts and beliefs associated to power. And normally power connected to white norms, to racism, and to consumerism. Another example of how to decolonize our minds is deconstructing linguistic and sociocultural ideologies and hierarchies, realizing that they exist, noticing how we promote them in our classes, and being aware that we need to resist them, that we need to transgress those ideologies and hierarchies. Another possibility to decolonize our minds is to re-theorize identity formation, who we are, who is us or who is them when I talk about we, they, when I talk about the native speaker, who am I talking about? When I talk about the non-native speaker, who am I referring to? So one strategy is to help ourselves and help our colleagues, our coworkers, our students to decolonize their minds. Possibility, possibilities, reconceptualizing language, learning, pedagogy, research, deconstructing ideologies and hierarchies, and re-theorizing identity, subjectivity. A second possibility that we have, or a strategy, is to decolonize our methods and curriculum. How can we do that? First, we need to develop awareness about relationships of power in the methods and curriculum that we're supposed to know how to um, know that they what they are and know how to use them or implement them in our classes. Because behind those methods and curriculum, there are authoritarian ideologies, and there is also the presence of the neoliberal global economy. So awareness about oppression is one step to decolonize our methods and curriculum. A second step, promote post-method pedagogy. To emphasize the attention that we need to give to particular contexts, to integrate or to connect theory and practice, practice and theory, and to empower our learners and to empower ourselves as part of possibility. Because method pedagogy emphasizes particularity, practicality, and possibility. I believe, and other authors agree with me, and other authors propose this idea of post method pedagogy as a way to decolonize our methods and our curriculum. And another possibility that we have, it's a reconstruction of the labels we use when we talk about the language learner and the language teacher, because we need to open ourselves to the diversity of identities that exist in, when we think about cultural diversity, translanguaging, world Englishes, language awareness, etc. Okay, so the second step or the second strategy, decolonize our methods and curriculum. But first, we need to decolonize our minds. Now, what I'm trying to do, another, another authors, other experts, other, other colleagues are trying to do it, decolonize our professional education. We need to understand that these kind of academic spaces are important not only to know or to receive the latest technique, the latest strategy, the latest tool, which is good. It's important. It's part of our professionalization. We need to know more, new things, more things. That is, of course, part of it. But more than that, we also need to learn, okay, but what is behind that, that new tool, that new method? What is behind that new possibility that is being presented as an, an, an option nowadays? As, as a member of, 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 my, of the community, as an academic, as a professional, what am I supposed to realize 
uh, apart from that technique, from that strategy, from that method, what's behind it? What are the premises? What are the values? What are the beliefs? So how can we decolonialize our professional education? One way to do so, awareness of the historical realities of English, particularly awareness of those realities in Colombia in relation to the colonial conquest and also in relation to the positionality of English in our society, in our history. Another possibility of how to decolonialize our professional education is to really explore, start to reflect about power and privilege and how those, those two concepts impact what we do, what we think. <clears throat> Another possibility is to examine the ideological foundation of certain um, activities that we do, such as standardized exams, such as following one suggested curriculum, one possibility of doing things in the classroom. We need to really examine what are the ideological foundations of those exams, of that curriculum. And we need to explore or generate alternatives and important also as part of this decolonialization of our professional education, the use of reflective teaching practices. Practices that are going to help us create transgressions and ruptures, ruptures to, dominant, to the dominant structures. Now, I'm going to show you some examples of what people are doing um, in Colombia. Here in this, in this slide, I'm trying to summarize the decolonial option. I was suggesting here three strategies or three possibilities to decolonize our minds, decolonize our methods and curriculum, decolonize our, uh, also our professional education. But in, in general terms, we can, you and I should agree that the, the, the colonial option is for most, first and foremost, an epistemic turn. It's understanding reality and knowledge from a different perspective, number one. Number two, it is connected to what is called a transformational theorizing. In other words, it is understanding the theory, the theory that we learn, that we replicate, that we use, has a colonial foundation and that we need to open ourselves as teachers, as professionals, to critical intercultural dialogues and to local to local connections. That's why I love these kind of events because it is giving me the possibility from Bogota, from Universidad de La Salle, in my PhD studies, to share with you in Tunja, in the different cities in Boyacá, where you are. And we are doing this critical intercultural dialogue in which we are trying to establish or to start local to local connections. And another idea for the colonial option, another premise connected to the decolonial option is a curriculum and a pedagogy of engagement. Engagement understood as bringing to the table issues such as gender, race, class, sexuality, decolonialism, identity, language, bringing those concepts and exploring them, discussing them, reflecting them. In other words, trying to open room and space for multilingualism and understanding of the diversity of our local contexts and the diversity of the different languages and the different knowledge systems that we have in our communities. To finish, I want to share with you what some Colombia, so some Colombia ELT teacher, educators, teachers are doing to take the decolonial turn to decolonialize ELT. I'm going to start and I'm going to focus because of time on uh, a, a work done by professors Clavijo Larte and Judy Jarki in the year 2019. And in this fascinating um, work, they propose or they advocate for knowledge and appreciation of our students' daily realities. We need to consider them as an object of a study in terms of communication, in terms of learning, in terms of language, in terms of research. And what they say here is that there is a disconnection between la vida en la escuela 
and la vida cotidiana. So it's like we live in the schools one way, and as soon as we go out of the schools, we do something else. Life out of the schools, it's unfortunately not related, not connected to life in schools. And our job as teachers is to make sure that, that's, that that doesn't happen and is to find possibilities that allow our students to develop and to answer, to develop the skills, the knowledge, the attitudes that they need to be able to survive, to resist, to transgress the daily life that they have out of our, our classes, our schools. In other words, it's, an, it's the idea of bringing into the class life experience history, the history of their communities, the language practices that our students face in their houses, and the promotion of social transformation and social justice. Now, I would like to share with you, in general terms, five um, decolonial pedagogies that different authors are putting into practice in, in Colombia, and that I think might help us all decolonize ourselves and to take the, the, the colonial turn. Because I'm going to share with you these five very quickly because I have probably one minute left or two. So these are five decolonial pedagogies or possibilities or alternatives that I invite you to explore, to know first, to get familiar with, and then to explore in your own context. They are community-based pedagogies or CBP, funds of knowledge, community-based learning, asset mapping, and participatory action research. So I'm going to repeat, community-based pedagogies, funds of knowledge, community-based learning, asset mapping, and participatory action research. Because of time, let me try to share with you quickly, um, I'm going to share with you what I believe is a summary of what I said, of what I have said so far. You might be wondering, okay, but what exactly is um, community of pedagogy, community-based pedagogies, literacies, and et cetera? Let me share with you my screen one, one last time in this one minute that I'm, I have left to give you an idea. Okay, I hope I'm sharing my, my, my screen with you. What is community-based pedagogy? It is opening ourselves and our schools to our students and their families. And it's making sure that what we do in our classes address and emphasizes the local knowledge and the local resources that our students and their families have as part of what we teach and what we learned. That would be, in general terms, a definition of community-based pedagogies. Funds of knowledge is the knowledge the skills and experiences that we acquire because we are members of a community. And that belonging to a community provides us with knowledge that is historically and culturally diverse. Now, what we should do as teachers, as professionals, is to explore those funds of knowledge that our students and their families have and to find ways to incorporate them into our, our classes. Community-based learning is the invitation to, again, open ourselves to um, what happens in our communities through history, through literature, through cultural heritage, through natural environments. And the idea that it's through that explicit work of what students and, and their families have that we are developing empowering uh, practices. To do so, we need to have an asset map that is an inventory of the strengths and the gifts, the possibilities, the good things that our students and their families have. We need to recognize what is good, who knows? Where, where is the knowledge that our students resort to? Their grandparents, the person who sells food in, in, in a particular store, etc. An asset map will give you an idea of how the entire community relates and the, intercon and the interconnections that they establish. And finally, something that most of us have heard, part or participatory action research, the idea of involving our students, their families, and their communities 
in what, what, whatever we try to do in our classes, in our schools. As you can see, and with this I finish, definitely there is uh, possibilities to engage in decolonizing ELT and becoming a, a, um, a community where we understand that we are a result of history, but also we understand that we have the possibility to transform that history. Thank you so much. Hello, Professor. Thank you so much for such an extraordinary presentation. That, ha that has us reflecting about teacher resistance in the ELT field. Thank you so very much. Fascinating topic. I have some comments from the audience. I would like to start with Sonia Marisol Rojas Espitia. She said, what an interesting and profound topic. It is something that matters to everyone. Thank you. Julia Elvira Martinez Reina, other possibilities should be the colonizing teacher sociocultural ideologies. Cesar Sembrano, good morning. This research is very interesting in terms of spending more the theory presenting and also being applied in particular contents. Professor Berta Ramos, exactly. In ELT, we usually focus on the how and the what and not the what for. Patricia King Jimenez, she said, yeah, that's true. Um, Alberto Ramirez, great reflection. In the end, we have been servers of the colonization of English, but since seeing things from a globalization perspective, we are bringing our students towards global citizenship. Mm -hmm. And Lady Marcena, she says, fascinating topic. David Molano, it is amazing talk. Um, professor, I have a question for you from, uh, one moment, please. Uh, the question. The question is from um, Miss Anna. She says, uh, some of the comments, um, but she said, um, I don't see the question. Oh. <laughs> this is the question, Professor Fandino. Thank you so much for your patience. And it says, how do you think English language professors in Colombia could start decolonizing our ELT practices? Excellent question. I think probably I would answer this question with a very simple answer. First, understanding who we are as members of ELT understanding where we come from, as I did at the beginning of my talk, that exercise of recognizing where and when I became a language teacher and now where and where I am being a language teacher. I think that awareness helps a lot. And also a sense of community. I think that by interacting with others, listening to what they have to uh, tell us, sharing their experiences, you can start noticing that there are issues, topics that are much more relevant relevant than the ones that we are told are, the, are, are required. So by talking to other coworkers, colleagues, we realize that there is such diversity that what is imposed on us is not what we should be doing or thinking or using. I, I would say it starts with ourselves first and then with our colleagues, with our coworkers next. Exactly. Thank you so much, Professor Fandino. And because of time, um, there is probably more questions in the in the YouTube video, in the YouTube chat, uh, if you can see them. But uh, to to give you a final uh, thank you, um, thank you so much, Professor Fandino, for being with us today and for sharing your knowledge with us because it is so it has been so enriching and. Um, Thank you again. Thank you for your time. And now I am going to introduce Miss Anna. She's going to present Dr. Cindy Cruz. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Uh, thank you so much for being with us today. Please, uh, we are reading all of your comments and questions in the chat. So please feel free to uh, leave us any comments that you would like. Uh, something that we forgot to mention is that all of our keynote speakers today were actually nominated. Um, so in the certificate, you will find a section for you to nominate next year's keynote speakers. Well, for me, it is such an honor 
to present our next keynote speaker, who is Dr. Cindy Cruz. Uh, Cindy Cruz is an associate professor in the Department of Teaching, Learning, and Social C Cultural Studies at the University of Arizona. She is a critical ethnographer of homeless youth cultures and technologies. Her research on LGBTQ street youth narratives, bodies, and testimonios centers in the theories and pedagogies and methodologies of U.S. feminists of color of thought. Thank you so much, Dr. Cindy Cruz, for being with us today. The floor is all yours. Thank you. Um, I, I just want to start by thanking the organizers of my virtual visit here at the 20, 21st, 21st Teachers Moot, but in particular, Dr. Bertha ramos Olguin and you, uh, Anna Peneloza, you are goddess, you know, and thank you. I'm humbled by your invitation, and I hope that we can engage in some important talk about youth and teaching and resistance research. So um, let me start my uh, presentation. And it has, I want to tell you that it has three distinct moments. One will be keywords in the style of Raymond Williams. So I'll start with that. And the keywords are modernity and trans survival. Um, another part of the paper will be my thinking about infrapolitics, because it's so important to me as a teacher and resistant socialities. And then the final part of the paper of the presentation today will be a close reading of a field note uh, about what I mean when I talk about resistance research. So let me start. So part one, trans survival. I wanna be begin with trans as a prefix where the term can mean across, beyond, and changing thoroughly, and survival as a practice of life under tremendous difficulties. Survival is something street youth learn quickly where your health and sanity depends on a certain amount of creativity, industrialness, and collaboration. To survive in Los Angeles, you learn quickly to stay out of the sun. You share information with those around you that breakfast can be found at my friend's place below the 101 freeway at Bronson, supper at the youth center on Highland and Selma, the emergency dentist at the Hollywood Sunset Free Clinic on Thursdays, and free condoms at the village in Ed Gould Plaza because the police will leave you alone there. Survival is also about sharing knowledge and practices, particularly for trans youth, in the effort to make your body what you want it to be, the small glass vials filled with hormones available for purchase at particular pharmacias near MacArthur Park, where they give you a hypodermic needle and show you not only how to inject into the muscles of the hip or the thigh, but also how to clean your needle with bleach and water. Native scholar Gerald Visner repurposes the term survival to survivance from its 16th century origins, where he writes that survivance is an active sense of presence, the continuation, the continuance of indigenous stories and histories, and is a renunciation of dominance, tragedy, and victimry. I wonder, does the, ter does the term come from a, a portmanteau of the word survival plus endurance, or maybe survival plus resistance, or my favorite, survival plus persistence? Visner frames indigenous survivance in ways that suggest moving beyond a mere subsisting in the ruins of native cultures to actively inheriting, hacking, repurposing, and reimagining culture for new practices beyond, across, and changing thoroughly. Perhaps queer and trans youth will find commonality in these practices of indigenous trans survival as they move beyond subsistence in the ruins of Los Angeles, where the repurposing, hacking, and reimagining of new technologies, such as using smartphones for the purpose of the exchange and barter of youth bodies in their attempt to avoid the surveillance of police, adds to their repertoire of languages, skills, and survival-rich ways of reading the word and the world. Maria Lagones gives us the term survival rich, a way of reading the worlds around you in recognition that others may also read you in ways that are ambiguous, incorrect, or even incommensurably, or as Lagones writes, and I quote, 
This ambiguity is funny, and it's not just funny, it is survival rich. We can also make the picture of those who dominate us funny, precisely because we can see the double edge. We can see them doubly constructed. We can see the plurality in them. So we know truths that only the fool can speak and only the trickster can play out without harm. We inhabit worlds and travel across them and we keep all the memories. Queer and trans youth actively develop survival rich technologies that are nothing less than movement filled, creative, agentic literacies. As a quick aside, when I was looking up survival and survivance, another term of the, another use of the term survivance signaled the worry of French colonists with the survival of the French language in the new world. Derrida's use of survivance also connects a kind of subjectivity of a spectral existence between life or death. This genealogy of survivance ignores life loving practices the V alive and the vivir to live of survival negated. You know, I love that Raymond Williams was so intrigued or maybe even troubled by the multitude of competing meanings for the term culture when he decided to develop this keyword project. So let me move to another keyword that I think also contains a multitude of meanings. Modernity can never be decoupled from coloniality. Global South theorists such as Anibal Quijano Walter Mignolo, Enrique Dussel, Ramon Grosfogo, and Nelson Maldonado Torres affirmed that modernity as a logic of Eurocentric global capitalism is the economic, intellectual, epistemological, and ontological engine fed by coloniality. I like to think of it as the term for the plunder of the new world. Modernity is always and must always be understood through coloniality. The invention of race is central in the reorganization of the new world. New hierarchies, new definitions of who can now be counted as human, logics that continue to make their way onto the everyday order of life in the Americas, even in this moment and time. Lisa Lowe's research traces these logics so well, yet there's a refusal among male scholars to engage gender and sexuality beyond that of reproduction. Let me make another relationship clear here. We are unable to decolonize without making gender and sexuality central. Laura Elisa Perez says it best. What would it mean for liberationist thinkers to take the theories of queer and feminists of color seriously? So let me shift gears to something that I do as a teacher of teachers. Recently, my work with schools and youth have taken me up and down the 101 freeway in California, where I'm allowed to visit college readiness programs in high poverty schools. These schools anchor the agricultural communities of the San Joaquin Valley, which is America's breadbasket. King City, Soledad, Greenfield, Chihuahua, Gonzales, and the Watsonville Pajaro Valley. They're all these tiny towns. In this project, I interview and talk with teachers, students, parents, counselors, program administrators, and the principal. Most students at these schools have parents who are agricultural workers and or migrants. Some of the students will drop out of school due to credit deficiencies. Some of them will leave school to work in the fields for economic necessity or to take care of their family members who are unable to care for themselves. Some of these students will attend a community college and some of them, very few will go on to the university and other four-year colleges. These schools serve the migrants and exiles of homelands wracked by war, US military interventions and World Bank policies displacing indigenous communities. You know what, those schools barely survive. Walking through these spaces, under-resourced schools and, and classrooms, hanging out, despite the sometimes overwhelming stress of public school economies, I always seem to find queer and trans youth. We make eye contact with one another. It is a recognition of one another's queerness that lingers just a second longer than usual, a mutual recognition. I smile. Some, maybe we can chat later, I think. We queers survive with endurance, resistance, and persistence. I often ask myself, 
how as a researcher and teacher educator, can I connect these ideas of modernity, coloniality with these studies of public schools? What are the practices that these youth and their families enact to resist coloniality? Maybe the homeless, queer, and trans youth that I work with in Los Angeles also need to be seen as forcibly displaced too. Youth are also migrants and exiles where their lives are also across, beyond, and changing thoroughly. So when I ask the question, hey, where'd you come from? With homeless, queer, and trans youth, with the students and their parents from these schools, it does not matter whether we, in, we are in Hollywood, or King City, Soledad, Greenfield, Chualar, Gonzales, or Watsonville, Pajaro Valley. I need to listen, trace, and map the plurality of their narratives of trans survivance, where these histories cross and re-engage. Sometimes when I look and listen carefully, fully present, I find these narratives of race, poverty, resistance, and persistence inscripted onto the bodies of queer and trans youth, migrants, exiles themselves, always across, beyond, and changing thoroughly. And again, learning resiliency and resistance as the practice of life under tremendous difficulties. Part two, I work with homeless, queer, and trans youth in Hollywood, California. My work is reflexive and ethnographic, and I draw from the humanities-oriented social sciences to analyze and think with the narratives, testimonials, and social texts I am offered from youth on the street. I center US women of color, Latinx, and decolonial feminist theoretical frameworks as lenses for the analysis of youth narratives and their experiences. I was a high school English teacher and an HIV counselor for many years, and this experience greatly influences my research and teaching and thinking about queer and trans youth. Thus, my central concern has been about how the theoretical work of U.S. third world, Latinx, and decolonial feminists interrupt how empirical research often approaches and conceptualizes the experiences and narratives of youth of color as deficit and inequitable, particularly with youth from Black and Latinx communities. So my, youth, my work with youth is driven by this belief that racially gendered equity and healing is essential in order to support homeless, queer, and trans youth and their communities. Part of, this, part of this work is in creating and strengthening the conditions in which vulnerable youth will succeed. Achieving any kind of equity for youth must be made in coalition with others who are also working to dismantle racially gendered, homophobic, and structural inequities that limit opportunities for youth health and survival. Youth communities are themselves reframing and reshaping urban realities through innovative and creative communities of practice. When teacher educators and youth researchers focus largely on deficit, I believe that we have at best missed and at worst masked the possibilities youth offer for urban transformation in our schools and communities. At this time, my work is centered on countering the deficit approaches to research as one that is often about fixing pathologized students. Under this rubric, change is forced upon youth, particularly youth of colors in scripted bodies. These research models attempt to enact a theory of change within a model of a patriarch-centered, two-parent, middle-class lifestyle. And I, I think so, so many of us can trace this standard to like the Moynihan Report of 1965 and other kinds of, of um, blue-collar, kind of blue-ribbon, um, is supposed to be working on war of poverty kind of reports that happened in the U.S. in the 60s and 70s. To counter such research in teacher education requires other kinds of methods and approaches to de-link or divest oneself from the research models of radical othering requires teacher educators and youth, res youth researchers to reframe the dialectics of domination and submission between youth and police, youth and their teachers, youth and their doctors, researchers, and other authorities. In my own work, I study youth resistance and infrapolitics informed by the work of Lugones and U.S. Feminists of Color Practices. Throughout my tenure as a teacher researcher with LGBTQ study students, I observe youth talking back, 
to teachers, police, and social service workers in all these bodily ways. It was the exaggerated snap of fingers in someone's face or the slow swagger of a student turning their back on an authority figure that caught my attention. Schools and youth centers, even those spaces whose mission emphasized the health and educational experience of LGBTQ students are often the place where, and I quote, the daily confrontations, evasive actions, and stifled thoughts of an infrapolitics is in place. Infrapolitics, I'm going to define it by using James Scott and Robin D.G. Kelly, as they are the spaces of offstage practices and the creation of dissident political cultures that show themselves in daily conversations, in the folklore of youth, in the, at job sites, in songs, and other cultural practices. These are all strategies of resourcefulness and innovation created by subjugated communities like homeless queer youth that help them negotiate the continuous scrutiny and containment by those in power. In this new work, I wanna be attentive to queer street youth practices of resistance and the tight spaces of youth in for politics. Yet I also wanna move away from the binary of oppressing, being oppressed, as I feel like this foundation is foundational and deficit in culture of poverty models of change. But for right now, I'm looking to find methods and pedagogies and epistemologies that help me move away from discourses of criminality and poverty that haunt how youth in color and queer street youth are represented in teacher education and social science research. So let me tell you a little bit about James Scott first because he defines this thing called a public transit, a transcript, as, and the public transcript is a public performance of deference and humility by the powerless. Further, Scott argues, the powerful uphold this public transcript through the maintenance of the symbols of a hierarchical social order. You know, I have to tell you, I love James Scott's uh, book, Domination and the Arts of Resistance, because in his epigraph, he has this funny thing. It says, when the great Lord passes, the wise peasant bows deeply and silently farts. So these onstage practices of a public transcript maintain the illusion of a particular social order. Um, let's say, for example, between street youth and the ever presence uh, security guards in social service centers in Los Angeles. These performances in the public sphere reveal very little information, if any, of the tensions and low intensity wars between street youth and the guards and or police or offer any sense of how power is wielded between communities. So now if an onstage performance is actually a public transcript, then the hidden transcript is the story that takes, that takes space off stage beyond the direct observation of those in power. For these communities, the hidden transcript is the space of rest and leisure, a place where youth gossip about their bosses, teachers, or caseworkers, and away from authorities' watchful eyes. It can be a hush arbor or a place to smoke a cigarette with others. Sylvia Winter, in her discussion of the Black arts movement, describes an infrapolitics where African-American poets and artists and musicians in these new socialities could develop new ways of being in the world. Taking control of Black representation narratives and ideologies, African-American artists and poets develop new languages and privileged African-American ways of knowing, and in some cases, found new ways to relate to one another that were not co-constitutive of white supremacy. And thinking about the possibilities of socialities of resistance, of understanding histories and ways that offer other communities frames to organize outside of oppression, I find great potential in recognizing these offstage spaces, especially for queer homeless youth. I wanna think of that, that infrapolitics can now be seen not only as these spaces to exchange valuable information about the inner workings of schools and other institutions, work sites and organizations, such as youth social service centers, Perhaps in my own work, I could push the idea of a sociality of resistance, not only as a hangout where youth share knowledge with others about technology, access to resources and places to avoid, but
but also as a space of great possibilities of learning activity, of pedagogies that help youth to relate to one another outside of the surveillance of authority in ways that aren't based on domination, but one where youth can practice non-hierarchical, non-capitalist or non-imperialist ways of being in the world. I'm seeking this kind of possibility in my new research on youth surveillance and safety, where young people negotiate technology as a space of bartering, exchange, and access to ex essential social networks against the knowledge of an overwhelming police presence, both in the streets and online. So part three, let me give you a little bit of my thinking about what this infrapolitics or resistance research, because now I'm gonna, I'm thinking about that idea, a little bit about what that might look like. So to research resistance is to take the stance that youth are not victims, but are often witnesses and survivors of great trauma and oppression. In order to recognize their resistance later, I have to first recognize the stories of oppression that students tell me on their own terms, and that's so important. And I do have an example. One 18-year-old Eastern European queer and undocumented youth offered me a story of meeting an older American photographer friend online, this friend, and you know what? I put quotations around the friend. This friend sends him a plane ticket to the United States so that they can meet. The youth was 16 years old at the time of the story. So let me, sh let me share my screen really quickly. Oh no, I don't wanna see this. Sorry for the delay in my PowerPoint. All right, let's start here. So here's the field note and I'll read it. Yuri would not tell me where he was from. Latvia, I'm not gonna tell you where I'm from, he told me, but that you are close, very close. So what brought you to the US? And Yuri says, I've always loved the internet and I would use the internet at home to meet men. Sometimes we would meet in a nearby large city and I would stay at a hotel or wherever he was staying. Sometimes we would meet at a local park or other times I would meet men at highway rest stops. I wanted to meet and talk with other gay men and there are no clubs or rap groups or any kind of gay organization. Being openly gay in my country is not an option. You can have a relationship on the internet. I've done it. You can use email or go in chat rooms with your chat name. I used a computer at a local coffee house every weekend to talk with people. I meet lots of friends online and we say hello and schedule meetings on the weekends. It's like a party online. We gossip and joke around. We find out who's dating who, where all the hot spots in their cities are, what happened to them in the last weekend. You can see all the infopolitics in this field note, right? Sometimes friends will send money to you so that you can meet them. That's how I came to the U.S. That's how I got to the U.S. I met him on the internet. We chatted for a few weeks, sometimes every day, and exchanged photos. He was an older man, a professional photographer, and one day he asked if, if he could meet me in person. I laughed at that because I was in this godforsaken country, and he was in large East Coast city. But he said he would fly me out and of course I didn't believe him, but a letter came with a plane ticket and off I went to meet him. I told my grandmother that I was going for just a little while to look for a job and with just a little rucksack, I got my passport and left for the US. I was 16 years old. When I got to this large East Coast city, I lived with this photographer who said that maybe I could work for him as photography is my passion. But after a little while, things weren't going to work between us, and I left him with the cash that he had given me. I stayed with friends for, for new, new friends for a while, crashing on their couches as I looked for work. Nobody was going to hire me, young and now illegal, as I had already over overstayed my visa. I did bar back work at a bar, but I didn't make enough to really live on, and slowly I found myself at the shelters, at the LGBTQ shelter and a social service agency shelter in the Lower East Side. 
I stayed in their temporary housing for a few weeks, but I wanted to leave this large urban city and I left the house and came to another large urban city on the bus. How does your undocumented status affect you? Well, it makes things a little harder. I'm not a citizen and I had even won a citizenship lottery. I had won a spot for citizenship, but I blew it. I didn't qualify. You need at least a high school diploma and I didn't have that kind of educational equivalent. I also found out that I could qualify for citizenship if I made over $100,000 a year. In this way, immigration services considered a person a productive contributor to society. Yeah, that's what they told me. I guess I'll have to wait until I make my millions. Right now, I'll just stay away from trouble and try not to get deported. You know, um, when I read this field note, um, and I read it like dozens of times, trying to figure out what I heard. Because usually when I get a story from a young person, I, I hear it. Sometimes I, I copy it on, I use a digital recorder and I go someplace and I just type it all out, everything I can remember. And so, um, and so I wanted to, to, to say that I understand now that there's several ways to hear Yuri's story. First, I have to acknowledge that this is a story of trafficking, a queer youth lured by a potential job in photography and a plane ticket that was reframed by the subject as the end of, the, of a relationship. The youth then leaves the short-lived, and I put quotations about, around relationship with cash in hand and soon finds himself homeless in a large East Coast city. But you know what? It was in the way that he framed the story to me that is important. Secondly, I have to recognize that in his telling of his story, the ending of the relationship is mutual for both the youth and the photographer. The youth leaves the older man on his own terms. His recasting of events is so significant, so important here, from being a youth caught in the traffic of queer bodies to a novice photographer yearning for a new life in the U.S. And finally, I have to understand that my reading of the trafficking of a young gay man becomes an intimately tied to my recognition of his refusal to be defined as a victim. He will not be seen as either expendable or totally exploitable, and he refuses to reduce himself in all these ways. I have to see that as a teacher and as a researcher. And yet I also recognize his narrative as one of a world in which youth, particularly undocumented youth, are trafficked. There are several narratives in place here where youth worlds and trafficking worlds exist simultaneously in multiple relations of power. If I only recognize the youth narrative of trafficking, I make a victim of the subject and emphasize the logic of oppression. My job as a teacher educator is to recognize that there are several worlds at work here, but maybe I can teach myself to recognize resisting behavior too, to recognize those worlds where a youth can see themselves as resistant beings. What is helpful in thinking about these multiple interpretations of a narrative is Lugonis's conception of world traveling. World traveling is the willful exercise of the experience of agentive negotiation by outsiders to the mainstream organization of life in the US, where queer youth and women of color and others from non-dominant communities occupy and move through multiple worlds in their daily existence. Lugonis recognizes that much of world traveling is done unwillingly to often hostile worlds and that for many people, we can occupy many worlds simultaneously. A key insight is that the self is multiple, where the self constantly changes in its movements across these multiple worlds as necessitated. So now in this world of trafficking, a student would be deemed exploitable, powerless, and utterly victimized. The young person in this field note refuses that world, and instead Yuri reframes his story in a world where he is perceived as ambitious and entrepreneurial. A teacher must be prepared to recognize this other world of trafficking with an awareness of more than one world being narrated here. In these multiple and contradictory worlds that exist in this example, I have to attend to the conflicts between how the youth sees himself in this reframe world as ambitious and entrepreneurial and how a teacher might see him much differently under similar circumstances, and how the youth sees the teacher. 
if world traveling is about a way of identifying what it is to be them and what it is to be ourselves in their eyes, then the teacher's role becomes so vital here in this negotiation of multiple frames, selves, and worlds. To create different interpretations of experience and to create new knowledges that are outside of the usual frames of a public performance of power is a risking together between the teacher and the student. It is an important re-envisioning of lived experience, and it often means challenging both subject and teacher to see what meaning can be made here. This is a narrative that goes against the grain of power, yet I believe that to recognize and validate the multiple narratives of this example is a critically important methodological move where this queer street youth story can be reclaimed as resistant, agentic, and sometimes even liberatory, even when it's so risky for the storyteller. I know that LGBTQ street youth take many calculated risks such as the student mentioned earlier, where young people may weigh the costs of certain kinds of decisions they make about their lives against a chance of immigrating to the US or even for a commitment of intimacy with those costs of exploitation and disconnection. In contrast to the very public moral panics that are prominent in the US around sexuality and gendered lives that rationalize the protection of young people by withholding information about safe sex contraception, and HIV. This student, Yuri, is well aware of the unequal transaction here between his 16-year-old undocumented self and this older American professional. Because of the politics of disguise and despite guarantees of anonymity in the research interview process, it may be that the youth testimony is still deliberately designed to have multiple meanings to shield the activities, the identities of the actors and the activities of the actors in the story. My work with LGBTQ students has strict protocols for anonymity that does not allow for names or places or information collected that can be linked back to the identities of the youth I talk with. I never ask for names or code any data by asking youth to give me two letters and two numbers along with other demographic information. My field notes are strictly redacted This may free youth to talk openly, yet the politics of the public or hidden transcript is a part of every public observation and every interview with students. If this is indeed a narrative crafted in what James Scott names as the zone of constant struggle to make sense of explicitly ambiguous narratives, I must also consider the resistant sociality of those tight spaces where such resistance is developed, encouraged, and given new meanings. So let me take a step back to think about Maria Lagones' idea of oppressing, being oppressed, resistance relation, because here is where the infopolitics, resistant sociality, begin to make sense as a model to think about youth practices. In my own work, I'm trying to make a shift I believe is necessary for acknowledging the movement that attends to the Lugonian oppressing, being oppressed, resisting relation. And let me show you, because you kind of have to see it. This comes out of her book, Pilgrimages, where she illuminates how the forces of oppression and resistance are linked. Oppressing, being oppressed, and then this kind of sign of resisting. I think without this visualization, we cannot see oppression, nor can we see how resisting behavior is always present. Notice that I use the the gerund, resisting. I don't say resistance resisting as something that's always happening. Maybe there's something wrong with teacher education research when we cannot see or perceive how power moves in these instances of oppression. Queer street youth are vulnerable subjects, and I want to emphasize the complexity of multiple, often simultaneous oppression in their narratives and experiences. But if I talk about homeless queer youth as the oppressed, I conceptually reify those students who suffer under the oppressive logics of race, homophobia, and poverty. And when I participate in making this conceptually real or concrete as a teacher or as a mentor or a researcher, all these roles I occupy, I also participate in a logic of domination. So for me to represent queer youth as oppressed or deficit while representing another group as an oppressor or hegemonic, 
becomes problematic when it creates this dichotomy that conceals this complex relational web in which multiple different youth interact within multiple different relations of power with each other. To acknowledge this complexity about student narratives, worlds, and, and relations is to recognize the multiplicity and heterogeneity of youth lives. So let me stop my share. Can you see me now? Um, so um, why the plural lives and why multiplicity? Um, in my experience, I have found that queer street youth, I, the queer street youth I teach narrate their lives and travel through many worlds in many different ways. If Lugonis' definition of worlds as this willful exercise of the experience of outsiders to the mainstream organizational life in the US can help me think about the narratives and experiences of how queer and trans youth and women of color and others occupy and move through multiple worlds of sense, I have to understand that some of them might be worlds that are home and familiar and that other worlds animate different parts of what others might see us as, whether you want them to or not, whether youth recognize themselves in these worlds that make you invisible or sometimes other than human, or worlds that are meant to define you as deficit, all within our daily experience. My work with queer homeless students in my classrooms has been my attempt to understand Lugones when she writes what it is to be them and what it is to be ourselves in their eyes. I feel like this requires a different kind of commitment in the field, one that ex is exemplified by the work of Sofia Viennes when she talks about moving beyond the role of researcher as a broker translator and Shirin Vesuvi's research as she thinks about her use of videotaping learners as, sur with, as surveillance. My own commitment then becomes infrapolitical where I write about LGBTQ students' lives against the grain of power. Dr. Judith Moscovich, who is a great friend of math education at UC Santa Cruz, visited my doctoral seminar on qualitative analysis and told our class that she refuses to represent teachers or students as incompetent in her research. Yeah, students and their teachers struggle in math classes, she said, but it is not about representing them as deficit or poorly trained or unable to learn. Understanding that there is so much damaging math research about Latino learners, then Judith Moscovich's decision to emphasize math competence becomes so important. It is a commitment to maintaining dignity and equity with people you are working with and a pedagogy of teaching new teachers and graduate students to really think about what or for whom are you doing this research for? Maybe now I can begin to understand how the students who tell me stories of trafficking and migration can exist in these multiple worlds simultaneously as whole competent, and I say Ulyssian, thinkers and change agents, as resistors and lively beings. I could choose to emphasize the world of trafficking as a teacher, but I don't, as I've decided, um, as a resistance researcher to write and see and hear this story in ways that make queer youth lives and experience central. Plus, I must say, I am tired of reading how suicide and despair are inscribed onto the bodies of queer students. When Jack Halberstam and others fetishize LGBTQ youth suicide and youth bodies, when affect and other psychoanalytic frames of reference become the mainstream discourse that centers pathology and often death, and think that that uh, project, it gets better, I really see it as, please, you know, really, please don't die. I have asked these scholars, have you ever talked with queer and trans youth? Have you ever heard their stories? For my own research agenda in teacher education, I have to honor this simul simultaneity and recognize this world where a youth has the agency and power to remove their body from a dangerous dependency and thus exploitative relationship. I have a choice in the research and teaching that I do, and I choose to emphasize this young person's agency. Without seeing the plurality of youth lives and worlds, it becomes difficult, if not impossible, to recognize the way students resist and practice infrapolitically. To pay attention to infrapolitical practices and resistance and resisting behavior is to help illuminate how youth narratives might be constructed in ways that are at odds with the totalizing 
dichotomous and hierarchical logics of worlds or deficit and cultural poverty frameworks are the norm for representing homeless queer youth of color. Youth work both in and outside of the classroom is sacred work. It's this approach that helps me recruit promising students to become social justice educators and later as teachers of teachers on their own. And every year in seminars, I begin my classes with this mantra. You want to work for social justice? Then become a teacher. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Cindy Cruz. You're getting a lot of messages in the comments. I would like to read some of them for you. Sure. Um, the first one is from Nancy Carvajal. I think this is in reference to something you said earlier, fairy, reading the word and the world. Mm -hmm. Agostina says, excellent. Aura Cuervo says, excellent presentation. Dr. Berta Ramos says, Dr. Cruz, listening to you is just fascinating. Thank you very much for sharing with us the profound research studies you undertake as an educator. Thanks for caring. Alexa says, thank you so much, Professor Cruz, for this talk. What a good opportunity to make us reflect upon several realities and how narrative research is a powerful tool to embrace who we are and to understand others. And we have a question from Juan Esteban Nino who says, Dr. Cruz, thank you for your presentation. What would be your advice for pre-service teachers that have never been exposed to difficult contexts, but who want to help those communities? Hmm. Um, you know, as teachers, it those difficult contexts are there, whether we see them or not. And it isn't until we really get to know students or give them opportunities to talk about their everyday lives in, their, in our classrooms, that we see it. You know, I didn't know that for the first year, first year and a half, I think, I was wondering why my students in my in my classroom, why I would only have half students sometimes. I would have what I would, I was supposed to have 25 students in a class and 12 would show up on any given day. And students would disappear for two weeks at a time, three weeks at a time, you know, and one of the jobs that I had also was we would call um, parents supposedly parents, we would call parents and say, hey, where's your kid? <laughs> you know, they didn't show up at school today. And often the numbers were disconnected. They didn't work. The addresses were wrong. People had moved. And later on, I was beginning to realize how many youth did not have, were unhoused, and how many youth ha or had been couch surfing or living in shelters or their families were living in motels. Um, and they were trying to go to school. And a school at that site, like it ended up being like this place where it was safe, where you could get a meal, where you could uh, talk to a teacher. And, and it was, uh, I was just kind of like, like what is going on that all these young people are, are without housing or homeless, or I was meeting kids who had been in the foster care system who had aged out, which meant they were 18 and they were still trying to finish their, their education um, to get their high school diploma. And yet once they aged out, they were on the street. And, and so um, all I had to do was ask a little bit, you know, how are you? And to listen, uh, all I had to do was, was really just kind of like get to know my neighborhood really, really well. And then, uh, and for me to kind of like use my, skills of ethnography to kind of figure out what's going on here. And also I had made these curriculum changes in the English uh, literature class in the composition class so that students were writing about their own lives. And that's where I heard, I guess it was a safe space. And that's where I heard stories of homelessness, abuse, survival, trans survival. And that's where I was beginning to realize that this school needed needed to be much more than a group of teachers with a roof over our heads. We needed social workers, nurses, the homeless um, mobile unit that come one, once a week. It needed uh, therapists, all these things. I think if you just scratch the surface of student lives, you'll see that in these kind of precarious times that when families fall apart, that's where you begin to see like 
um, all these issues. And I, you have to have a particular kind of economic foundation in order for families to thrive. Most countries, including the U.S., do not have that space as of right now. Yes, absolutely. Um, we have some more comments for you. One from Nancy Carvajal again. In Colombia, we do have realities of oppression and discrimination. LGBTQI plus continues to be minoritized and oppressed institutionally and socially. We have huge challenges in, as individuals and educators as a nation. Santiago Sandoval says, as I was listening to you, Dr. Cruz, a mix of readings, educational films, documentaries, and more came to my mind. You made me reflect upon my role as an individual in the society, and that is it. Thank you. And we have time for one more question. Uh, this one comes from Axel Flores, who says, those students that are, that are silenced, they are also being eliminated in the dialogue, right? How can you be free in an emotional relationship that silences? Sometimes you have to read between the lines of silence. You know, um, when youth don't uh, participate or when youth don't share their stories, I, I think uh, maybe as a teacher, uh, you have to be a little persistent because you want to know, uh, nobody ever asks young people how you're feeling or what what life is like today. And, your, you know, teachers have that, they have a um, they have they have the they have a chance to to ask those kinds of questions in a really like good way. I think as a teacher, you have to make yourself vulnerable so that young people can see that you make yourself vulnerable. And so that vulnerability, um, I guess that's kind of like being with students so that you also can be in solidarity with students as they tell you their stories. I don't think that we can really understand some stories, like some stories I'm just like, what? You walked all the way from Los Angeles, from El Salvador, you know? Um, I have no idea how that, what must have happened to that young person who told me that story. But you know what? I can be there as a witness. And maybe that's another stance that teachers can take that we are witnesses to uh, the everyday kind of realities of young people in our in our respective countries. Uh, and we can be witnesses to kind of what happens. And, and so instead of thinking about like being empathetic or trying to understand, or I'm not into this idea like of walking in someone else's shoes. That's why I like Lugones when she says uh, what it is to be them and, and what it is to, uh, to uh, be able to understand how someone else sees us. I, I think that that kind of, it's different. It's like another maneuver, it's another move. And so I think that for us to be faithful witnesses to young people and what happens to them, but also to be, to be that faithful witness is also to understand and recognize that they survived, that they're resilient and that, and that they're still here. And that that's part of that faithful witnessing so that we don't create victims. And that's so important. Yes, as one of the things that you mentioned in your talk today that I wrote is youth are not victims, but survivors, and they can see themselves as resisting beings. So mm -hmm. I will keep that quote in my heart. <laughs> oh, thank, thank you, you so much, Dr. Cindy Cruz. Um, there are so, so many comments. <laughs> that I will be sending you to, to your email later on. So you can. Oh, that'd be great. Um, yes. Thank you all for, for listening to me. I know it's kind of long, uh, but I really enjoyed this, this uh, talk and uh, congratulations to all the graduates. Yay. I love that there's new teachers. <laughs> all right. Bye-bye. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Cindy Cruz. And with this presentation, we close the morning. Um, the morning presentations, we want to thank Dr. Dario Vanegas, Professors Carolina Rodriguez Buitrago, and Marta Ramirez, Professor Jamil Fandino, and of course, Dr. Cindy Cruz for being with us this morning. We are also very grateful with the audience for all of your comments, your questions. Remember that uh, your comments, we will be able to see them later and share them with all of our presenters. So thank you so much for participating. And now we close, as I mentioned, the morning session. And we start from 2 to 3 p.m. 
with professors Astrid Nunez Parto and Professor Maria Fernanda Tellez Tellez in the afternoon. So we will have that keynote presentation. And then from Thai, we will have our concessions. So you can click on uh, the links and check out the concurrent sessions in the afternoon. So for now, we will say goodbye. We hope you have a wonderful lunch break and we will see you from two to three.